Hi, Bacho. Welcome to Clinical Edge OBS and Gynae. Now, what is this Clinical Edge in OBS and Gynae? Clinical Edge in OBS and Gynae is an OBS and Gynae clinic where you and me together are going to see a number of antenatal patients, a number of gynae patients, and together we are going to make their diagnosis. Together we are going to see what investigations to do, and together we are going to manage them. So this is going to be very interesting. Hi, everyone. I am Dr. Sakshi Arora Hans, your OBGY faculty at Marrow. Welcome to Clinical Edge in OBS and Gynae. So, are you all prepared? Chalo, let's call our first patient. Now, our first patient, she is Mrs. Sharma, a 32-year-old female with history of mitral stenosis who is presenting in your clinic for preconceptional counseling. She also has hypertension and is a known case of epilepsy. She is on captopril and carbamazepine. Her seizures are well controlled and the last seizure which she experienced was five years back. What advice are you going to give to her? Now, but you please understand that preconceptional counselling, this trend is not there in your government hospitals. But once you go for your private practice, you are going to get patients of who are going to come to you for preconceptional counselling. And when you are doing the preconceptual counselling, you have to identify in them what are the risk factors. You just don't need to identify the risk factors. You have to modify those risk factors so that you can prepare the mother for a healthy pregnancy outcome. Right. Now, generally, generally, most of the times females who are going to come to you for preconceptional advice, they are going to be those females who have some chronic medical disease. For example, those who have heart disease, for those who have diabetes, those who have hypertension or those who are on anti-epileptic drugs. This is the category of female generally who come for preconceptional counselling. Now, uh, whether it is a female who has any of these uh, medical problems, any of these chronic diseases or any female, any other female who is coming to you for preconceptional counselling, one thing which you have to do in all of them is to give them folic acid to prevent the neural tube defects from happening. Right. And all of you know that the dose of folic acid which has to be given to all pregnant females who don't have any history of neural tube defects is 400 micrograms. And this should be started one month before conception and it should be taken till three months before conception. This is something which all of you know. You also know this that all females in whom there is history of any previous uh, neural, neural tube defect baby, in such females the dose of folic acid is 4 milligrams per day and you have to start it from three months before conception. Now, but you, we are obstetricians. We are not astrologers that I can tell a female that exactly but three months from now you're going to become pregnant. So, start taking folic acid. 4 milligrams. So, although this is a very theoretical answer that you have to start 4 milligrams 3 months uh, prior to her conception, ideally whenever a female who has a, pre, uh, who has a history of neural tube defect and she conceives and she's thinking of conceiving, you know, then from that particular time you are going to start giving her 4 milligrams of folic acid per day and again you are going to continue in her folic acid up till 3 months after pregnancy. Now, what about a female who is diabetic? Now, whenever a diabetic female comes to you, then please don't say that the dose of folic acid which I am going to give her will be 4 milligrams per day. No. Any diabetic patient who comes to you, the dose of folic acid which you have to give in her, uh, give in her is 400 micrograms. Now, what about patients on anti-epileptic drugs? Patients on anti-epileptic drugs. Now, this screenshot just now I am going to show you from Williams because there is a lot of confusion with respect to what dose of uh, folic acid has to be given to anti-epileptic drugs. So believe you me, what I'm telling you is directly from the lines of Williams that whenever a female is on anti-epileptic drug, then before conception, the dose of folic acid which you have to give her is 400 micrograms. And once she conceives, then the dose which you have to give her is 4 milligrams per day. And similarly, to treat sickle cell anemia, this is to treat sickle cell anemia, right? The dose is 4 milligrams per day. So, this is something which you have to do in all pregnant females, whether they have a risk factor or they don't have a risk factor. Preconceptionally, you have to put them on folic acid. So, when my patient comes in who has history of mitral stenosis, who is... Uh, 
uh, has history of hypertension and she's on anti-epileptic drugs, then I am going to give her folic acid how much? 400 micrograms because this female doesn't have any history of baby with neural tube defect, right? So, please don't say that you're going to give her 4 milligrams, no. Now, any female who's coming to you with chronic hypertension and she's asking you for antenatal advice, you have to remember two things about hypertension in pregnancy. Number one, remember that during pregnancy, peripheral vascular resistance decreases. That is because of the hormone progesterone. So during pregnancy, BP decreases and this decrease in BP is maximum in second trimester. It is maximum in diastolic BP and it is maximum when a pregnant female lies supine. That is what is called as a supine hypotension syndrome. So to all pregnant females, we have to advise them that especially from third trimester onwards, they should not be lying supine. They have to lie in left lateral position right? That is about some physiology related to BP. Now, if a female has chronic hypertension before pregnancy, what risks does she carry during pregnancy? So, during pregnancy, this patient is going to carry a risk of having superimposed preeclampsia, right? And she's going to have a risk of preterm labor, any kind of maternal stress, you know, that stress could be hypertension, that stress could be diabetes, that stress could be anemia, that stress could be kidney disease, any kind of maternal stress or any kind of fetal stress. It prematurely activates the fetal HPA axis and because fetal HPA axis gets activated, that leads to preterm labor. So, if a female has chronic hypertension, she carries a risk of preterm labor and remember, one of the most important risk factors for abruptio is hypertension. So, whenever a chronic hypertensive female is conceiving, you have to make the female as it is your doctor and it is the right of a patient to know what all complications can happen in a pregnancy. We don't mean to scare her, but we need to tell her that these are the complications which might happen to you during pregnancy, which are number one, superimposed preeclampsia, number two, abruptio and number three, she can go into preterm labor. Then uh, as a part of preconceptual counseling in a chronic hypertensive patient, you need to uh, analyze what antihypertensives is she on because there are certain antihypertensives which are contraindicated in pregnancy. For example, ACE inhibitors, for example, angiotensin receptor blockers, and for example, disoxide. So, if your patient is on any of these three antihypertensive drugs, you are going to stop these antihypertensive drugs and you are going to give her a safer replacement of these antihypertensives. So, what is a safer replacement for chronic hypertensive patients? Now, William says that there is not one single drug which you can say is a drug of choice for chronic hypertension in pregnancy. It says that out of three drugs which it has labeled it as first line drug, you can give any of them to your patients and what are those three drugs? Number one, you can advise oral methyl dopa. Number two, you can give her oral labetalol or you can advise her oral nifedipine. Out of these three drugs, any of them can be given to the patient before she conceives and you have to stop her from taking ACE inhibitors, ARBs and disoxide. Then obviously, you have to do a folic acid supplementation. Now, another very important point which you have to remember. Although this particularly doesn't come under the category of uh, preconceptual counseling, but remember, because chronic hypertensive patients, they carry a risk of superimposed preeclampsia. So, in all patients who are chronic hypertensive, from, we are going to advise them to take aspirin from 12 to 16 weeks of pregnancy. And this has to be taken till 36 weeks of pregnancy. This aspirin is given to prevent her from having the superimposed preeclampsia, right? Now comes a very, very important guideline. And that guideline is in which category of females is this kind of recommendation given? So remember, ACOG says, ACOG says that if your patient, so I am going to tell you a mnemonic which all of you are going to remember because this was something which came in Williams last year edition, right? So, 26th edition of Williams and that is all hypertensive mothers can die and K a N is can how you're going to write. So, all hypertensive mothers can die and I'm sure all those who are marrow subscribers, they already know this uh, mnemonic and this is also there in my book One Touch Obs and Gynae. So, A stands for APLA syndrome. 
a female with APLA syndrome, if she conceives, then starting from 12 to 16 weeks of pregnancy, we give her low dose aspirin, which has to be continued till 36 weeks of pregnancy. H stands for chronic hypertension. M stands for multifetal pregnancy, right? K stands for kidney disease. And D stands for diabetes. So, in these five categories of females, Starting from 12 to 15 weeks of pregnancy, you have to give them aspirin. And why is this done? This is to done. This is done to prevent PIH in them, right? So this is what I have to do in a female who comes to me with chronic hypertension and uh, the, you know she is planning to conceive. Now. What about the preconceptional advice which I have to give to a diabetic female? To a diabetic female, I have to number one tell that during pregnancy, your, there will be insulin resistance, right? So the dose of insulin which you are going to take will increase as the pregnancy is going to advance because pregnancy is a diabetogenic state. That is one thing which I have to tell them. This is the physiology which should be made clear to them. Right? You also have to make them aware of all the risks which are going to happen. So, in diabetic patients, in their babies, there is increased risk of congenital malformations. And this is something which you have to tell them very nicely because it is this particular female, it is the mother who can prevent the baby from having congenital malformations by maintaining a strict uh, control over her glucose level. So, you have to make her aware of this fact. Number two, you have to tell them that most common fetal complications which happens uh, during pregnancy is macrosomia. This is something which you have to make aware them aware of and that is how comes the role of diet modifications, lifestyle modifications because we don't want baby to be macrosomic. And number three, you also have to tell her that you yourself have a risk of having PIH, polyhydramnios, preterm labor. Because of polyhydramnios, a number of complications like cord prolapse, malpresentations, PPH, subinvolution, all of them can happen. Right. Also, please make the patient aware of this fact that during pregnancy uh, in diabetic patients, if the, her diabetes is not well controlled, then there are increased chances of abortions, there are increased chances of stillbirth and IUD. So, all these risks you have to make your patient aware of whenever she's coming to you for preconceptional counseling. Now, and you also have to tell her that she is the one who can help in avoiding a number of complications by having a strict control of glucose. Number two, during preconceptional period, make them aware of the fact that oral hypoglycemic agents are uh, contraindicated during pregnancy. So, it is better that rather than switching from OHAs to insulin during pregnancy, it is better if you can switch them from OHAs to insulin in the preconceptional period, right? Oral hypoglycemic drugs are contraindicated in pregnancy. There are two oral hypoglycemic drugs which may be used. One is metformin, uh, metformin and the other one is glyburide. But please remember, these oral hypoglycemic agents can be used in a gestational diabetic patient, not in a patient who is having overt diabetes or pre-gestational diabetes. Your patient is a case of pre-gestational diabetes, right? So, you cannot give them oral hypoglycemic agents whether it is metformin or whether it is glyburide. Now, this brings me to a question. So, if someone asks you, what is the drug of choice for treating diabetes in pregnancy, gestational diabetes in pregnancy, please don't say it is metformin or, or, or glyburide. Even for gestational diabetes, the drug of choice is insulin. Only if your patient refuses to take um, insulin, then you have to advise her to take metformin or glyburide. So, in preconceptional counseling, in your pre-gestational diabetic patients, explain to them, number one, that they have to maintain strict glucose or uh, strict control over glucose. Number two, they have to switch over from uh, oral hypoglycemic agents to insulin. So, switch them over before pregnancy. Number three, tell them that because we want a strict control over glucose, that is why you have to, uh, you know, follow lifestyle modifications. You have to follow diet modifications. And the fancy name for diet modifications is medical nutrition therapy. So, in case of pre-gestational diabetes, when a patient is conceiving, you are starting insulin plus 
medical nutrition therapy simultaneously whereas this is not the case in gestational diabetes when i we are going to see a patient of gestational diabetes i will tell you that if a patient of gestational diabetes come to you so if diabetes is diagnosed during pregnancy then initially you have to give mnt for 2 weeks right and if patient's metabolic goals are not meant on mnt then you put her on insulin but this is not the case in pre gestational diabetes in pre gestational diabetes immediately once the pregnancy is diagnosed you have to put them on insulin and on medical nutrition therapy then again you have to advise them to take folic acid how much folic acid 400 micrograms and as i told you that all hypertensive mothers can die so in diabetic patients also you are going to give them uh, aspirin low dose aspirin and this low dose aspirin is given to prevent pih and this has to be started from 12 to 16 weeks of pregnancy going up till 36 weeks of pregnancy right so whenever a diabetic patients comes to you for pre conceptional counseling these are the things which you have to keep in mind right now coming to anti epileptics so patients who are on anti epileptics what about them so first let us see which anti epileptics are absolutely safe in pregnancy there are two anti epileptics which are absolutely safe in pregnancy one is levetiracetam and the other one is lamotrigine between levetiracetam and lamotrigine it is levetiracetam which is slightly more safer and preferred agent than lamotrigine so suppose if your patient is conceived has conceived and she gets her first epileptic fit during pregnancy right so if epilepsy is diagnosed during pregnancy then the drug of choice becomes levetiracetam followed by lamotrigine clear to all of you now comes let us look at those anti epileptic drugs which have a teratogenic effect so most teratogenic is valproic acid and the second most teratogenic agent is phenytoin right so the most teratogenic is uh, valproic acid and the second most is phenytoin so suppose now the guidelines say that if you have a patient who is on anti epileptics and such a patient has conceived now in such a patient you have to continue the same anti epileptic continue with the same anti epileptic except if your patient is on valproic acid only if your patient is on valproic acid then you have to change to a safer anti epileptic right but otherwise if a seizures are controlled on any anti epileptic and such a female conceives then during pregnancy continue the same anti epileptic keeping a few things in mind number 1 monotherapy is to be preferred during pregnancy we don't prefer combination of anti epileptic drugs during pregnancy during pregnancy we prefer to give a single anti epileptic drug and you have to give the lowest possible dose of the drug during pregnancy right so uh, this is what you have to remember when it comes to anti epileptic drugs now i told you that i am going to show you a direct screenshot from williams where we are talking about the a dose of folic acid which has to be given to females with on anti epileptic so this over here is from williams so you can read over here oral so this is about women with epilepsy a uh, women with epilepsy ideally are counseled before pregnancy and that is what is preconceptional counseling oral folic acid supplementation with 0.4 mg per day is begun at least 1 month before conception the dose is increased to 4 mg when the woman taking anti epileptic medication becomes pregnant and that is exactly what i told you a female who is on anti epileptic drugs the dose of folic acid which you have to give her is 400 micrograms before conception and after conception 4 mg per day so i hope this clears your confusion on the dose of folic acid in females who are on anti epileptic drugs right now coming to pre conceptional counseling with patient uh, in patients with heart disease now that's something very important right so in a patient of heart disease see a uh, heart disease is one problem which might lead to maternal mortality during pregnancy right so we have in all these patients who have heart disease you have to have actually a very good preconceptional counseling during preconceptional counseling number one you have to make these females aware that it is not this that if they have a heart disease their baby cannot have a heart disease there is a risk of recurrence of heart disease and this risk of recurrence of heart disease it varies from lesion to lesion being maximum for vst right so if a female with vst conceives then there are some chances that the baby is also going to have vst number 
Number two, in the preconceptional counselling, you have to do their ECG and ECO. These are two investigations which you have to do in females with heart disease who are planning conception. And number three, if cardiac surgery is needed, then it is better to perform cardiac surgery first and then conceive. You know, cardiac surgeries are not safe during pregnancy. You do them only if it is an emergency situation. You know, if you... If the disease is very severe and you have to do it, then you do it during pregnancy. But ideal situation is that if cardiac surgery is required, then a female should first have a cardiac surgery and then she should conceive. The next important thing is you have to classify all these females into high risk or low risk. What do you understand by high risk or low risk? High risk for having any cardiac event during pregnancy or low risk for having any cardiac event during pregnancy. Now, there are a number of classifications which tell you whether a female has high risk of having cardiac event in pregnancy or not. The most commonly used one and the one which has the best predictive value, that is the classification which is given by WHO, that is WHO's classification. WHO classification divides all patients with heart disease into four categories, class 1, class 2, class 3, class 4, where class 4 means that the, if a female with class 4 uh, heart disease conceives there are 25 to 50 percent chances that she's going to die that is why females with class 4 who class 4 in them pregnancy is contraindicated and that category becomes very very important right so they ask you in which heart diseases is pregnancy contraindicated so you should know the list and just now i'm going to make you write down the list all marrow subscribers you already know that what are the heart diseases where pregnancy is contraindicated so, uh, we will do this just now. Number two, I just want all of you to remember these names. The names of these classifications in which uh, if they ask you for congenital heart disease, which uh, classification is used for... Um, you know, prognostic purpose, then it is the Zahara score and for acquired heart diseases, it is the Carprex score. No need to know the details. Just this much that for congenital heart diseases, there is a predict, uh, prognostic classification which is called as the Zahara score and for acquired heart diseases, it is the Carprex score. You just need to know slight details of WHO classification and that too you need to know what are the heart diseases where pregnancy is absolutely contraindicated. In other words, WHO class 4. So, these, this is a list of uh, heart diseases where pregnancy is contraindicated. I have covered them in marrow with you. So, uh, if left ventricular ejection fraction, it becomes less than 30%. But first tell me what happens to normally during pregnancy, what happens to left ventricular ejection fraction? Remember, left ventricular ejection fraction, JVP and pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. These three parameters during pregnancy, these are cardiac parameters which during pregnancy remain normal. So, normally uh, left ventricular ejection fraction is, uh, it remains normal or unchanged during pregnancy. Now, if due to a heart disease, if left ventricular ejection fraction becomes less than 30%, then in such situations, pregnancy is contraindicated, which includes if there is a severe mitral valve, a severe mitral valve stenosis. Uh, normal, what is the area of mitral valve? Normally, the area of mitral valve is 4 cm square. So, if the mitral valve area, if it becomes less than 1.5 cm square and patient is symptomatic, that is what is called as severe mitral stenosis. Similarly, if there is severe aortic stenosis where the valve area becomes less than 1 cm square or any heart disease which belongs to NYHA class 3 or class 4. You all have done NYHA classification in medicine. So, any heart disease where uh, you know patient is having dyspnea at rest that is NYHA class 4 or dyspnea at less than usual activities less than ordinary activities that is NYHA class 3. So, any heart disease which belongs to NYHA class 3 or class 4 pregnancy is absolutely contraindicated. Then Marfan syndrome remember it's not just a plain Marfan syndrome. If they ask you is pregnancy contraindicated in Marfan syndrome? No, pregnancy is not contraindicated in Marfan syndrome. Only if in Marfan syndrome there is aortic root dilatation more than equal to 4 centimeters, then pregnancy is contraindicated. Then coarctation of iota pregnancy is contraindicated. Pulmonary hypertension, whether it is primary or whether it is secondary. An example of secondary pulmonary hypertension is Eisenmenger syndrome. In Eisenmenger syndrome, pregnancy is contraindicated. Now, one very important fact which is asked as questions also you have to remember 
that if they ask you which heart disease has maximum risk, which heart disease carries maximum risk of maternal mortality. So it is this Eisenmenger syndrome which carries maximum risk of maternal mortality. Now my next question to you. Tell me, uh, a patient of Eisenmenger syndrome, why does she die? But she dies because of what problem? She dies because of right ventricular failure. Then what is the most common time at which, you know, the death is going to happen? Death is going to happen at the time of labor, right? Or within 24 hours of labor. That is the most common time when a patient with uh, Eisenmenger syndrome can die, right? Then uh, we have peripartum cardiomyopathy with residual defect. So not every peripartum cardiomyopathy is pregnancy contraindicated. Only if that peripartum cardiomyopathy has some residual defect. Similarly, if you have done a fontan surgery, where do you do a fontan surgery? A fontan surgery is done in hypoplastic left hearts, and, uh, left hearts, right? So whenever you've done a fontan surgery and there is some residual defect, then pregnancy is contraindicated. So these nine conditions should be on your fingertips. Whether you are a clinician, whether you are appearing for NEAT or whether for NEXT or for INI set. This is very important for you to remember what are the heart diseases where pregnancy is contraindicated, right? Now, uh, this question they can ask in this way also, you know, pregnancy is contraindicated only if a patient is coming to me in the preconceptional period, then I can tell her that pregnancy is contraindicated. In your case, you shouldn't conceive. But suppose a patient of Eisenmenger conceives and comes to me. Then in that case, then in that case, I'm going to do an MTP. So whether they ask me what are the heart diseases where pregnancy is contraindicated or whether they ask me what are the heart diseases where MTP has to be done, it is the same, right? Now, all this information which I have given you, if you feel that this is, you know, from a clinician point of view, yes, ma'am, this is important or this is important from theoretical point of view, uh, how is this information going to be useful to us? Now, if you are giving NEAT, if you are giving NEXT, then also this information is very important to you. For example, if I ask you this question and I'm giving you some options, now you are going to tell me whatever I have told you just now about my patient. Now you're going to tell me what all are you going to do in this patient. So now read the question very carefully. Mrs. X, she's gravida zero. Aged 30 year presents to you or OPD for preconceptional care. She has been married for one and a half years and she and her husband are now interested in conceiving. Mrs. X has hypertension. So that is important. She has hypertension. She is a known case of epilepsy. She is on captopril and carbamazepine. Her seizures are well controlled and the last seizure which she experienced was five years back. What advice are you going to give her? Now, in this, they have given you that she has hypertension, she has epilepsy, she is on captopril and she is on carbamazepine, right? Now, they have given you number one, 400 micrograms of folic acid, number two, folic acid, four milligrams, number three, strop captopril and prescribed nifedipine, number four, start aspirin from 12 weeks of pregnancy, number five, stop carbamazepine and prescribe lamotrigine. Select the statements which you would give her as advice. Now, this is the kind of a questions which we are expecting in next that you will be given a select a few statements and you have to choose what are the correct statements from there and you might be given five options. So, you should know how to approach these types of questions and these type of questions cannot be answered just by mugging up the answers. For these types of questions, it is very, very important that your concepts and your basics are very clear. So, uh, folic acid, how much are you going to give in her? She's on anti-epileptic drugs. So she doesn't have any history of uh, neural tube defect. So, I'm going to give her 400 micrograms, not 4 milligrams. Am I going to stop captopril and prescribe nifedipine? Yes. Am I going to start aspirin from 12 weeks of pregnancy? Yes, because uh, she is hypertensive, right? So, all hypertensive mothers can die. You remember that mnemonic? Then start carbamazepine and prescribe lemoturgine? No. If her seizures are well controlled, I'm not going to shift her from carbamazepine to lamotrigine. So it has to be 1, 3 and 4 which I have to do which means option C is the correct answer. Right? So every patient teaches you a lot. So this Mrs. Sharma has taught us a lot. Now let's see 
and call our second patient. Our second patient is a 23-year-old G2P1 who is presenting at 32 weeks of gestation with edema and moderate headache. Okay, Her BP is 146 by 92 of mil, uh, millimeters of mercury. Heart rate is 82. Respiratory rate is 16 breaths per minute. Physical examination reveals 2 plus pitting edema. Now, whenever you are reading a question, whether it is a lengthy question, whether it is a short question, make it a habit of marking the keywords. Just now, recently, I had taken a class and during the class when I was, uh, you know, asking you people to solve MCQs with long stems, I saw most of you sitting like this and reading the question. Very few of you had your pens in your hand or your highlighters in your hand and you were marking the keywords. See, whenever you are given a clinical question, the question has a very long stem. So, you just can't waste your time reading the question twice. In the first go itself, you have to mark what are those keywords, right? Over here, your patient has come to you at 32 weeks and her BP is 146 by 92. So, first tell me what is the next step? Now, Immediately when a patient has a high BP, don't say that I am immediately going uh, to, you know, start antihypertensives or am I going, I am going to say that she's a case of hypertension, nothing like that. If patient's BP has come out to be raised once, then always you have to repeat her BP in four hours. If it, two readings are high, and that too at an interval of at least four hours. Then you say your patient has hypertension in pregnancy, right? Just one high reading could be a lab coat effect. It could be a white coat effect, right? That is one thing. But that doesn't mean if your patient's BP is more than equal to 160 by 110. So, if your patient's BP is more than equal to 160 by 110, in that case, please don't say that ma'am said that I have to repeat the BP in four hours. No. If BP is more than equal to 160 by 110, then in that case, you have to repeat the BP in 15 minutes because in this case, you will have to start antihypertensives, right? So, in this case, you can't say that I'm going to repeat her BP after 4 hours. So, number one thing, whenever a patient's BP comes high, the second thing is repeat, do, do a second reading, number one. Number two, once you are sure that yes, her BP is high, then the next step which you have to do is you have to check whether proteinuria is present or not. And the screening test for proteinuria is you have to check her urine dipstick test. You have to do a urine dipstick test. Now, that is the screening test for PIH and in all PIH patients, urine dipstick becomes more than equal to plus one. So, if urine dipstick is more than equal to plus one, then you have to order for a 24 hours urine protein excretion, right? Or for protein is to creatinine ratio because these two are then the gold standard tests for knowing whether proteinuria is present or not. So, first thing what I have to do is repeat her BP, then I have to do a urine dip stake. If that comes out to be more than equal to plus one, then I have to go for 24 hours urine protein excretion. Then comes the second question, how are you going to classify her? Whenever a patient has high BP and she's coming to you in pregnancy, how do you classify her? Now, in order to classify your patients, you have to see whether the increase in BP is happening before 20 weeks or after 20 weeks. If it is happening before 20 weeks, it means the patient was a case of a hypertension and a hypertensive patient has conceived. In other words, she's a case of chronic hypertension in pregnancy. Right? Number one. Number two, if the increase in BP is happening after 20 weeks, then look whether proteinuria is present or not or if signs of end organ damage are present or not. If your patient has an increase in BP after 20 weeks, there is no proteinuria, there are no signs of end organ damage. That means you are dealing with a case of gestational hypertension, right? Now, suppose your patient's BP increases after 20 weeks of pregnancy and there is proteinuria or there are signs of end organ damage. That means you are dealing with a case of preeclampsia. Sometimes what happens is that in a chronic hypertensive patient, you know, suddenly at 20 weeks, the, her BP becomes uncontrollable or suddenly at 20 weeks, she develops new onset proteinuria or suddenly at 20 weeks, uh, signs of end organ damage developed. Then this is what is called as chronic hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia, right? And to prevent this condition from happening to all chronic hypertensive patients, what were we giving? We were giving them aspirin. 
Now, if a patient of severe preeclampsia throws convulsions, then we say my patient has become eclamptic. So, that is how you have to classify your patient. So, look over here. In your case, they haven't told you anything much. They have told you that her BP is 146 by 92 and then depending and her BP is increasing after 20 weeks of pregnancy. That means uh, she is a case of pregnancy induced hypertension. Whether she is a case of gestational hypertension or preeclampsia, I will come to know when they give me further information with respect to their her proteinuria or further uh, with respect to her signs of end organ damage. Now this term over here moderate headache. Now whenever a patient of PIH has severe headache right and that severe headache is you know some a headache which is not getting controlled by usual medications then that is also a sign of end organ damage right that is a sign of basically impending eclampsia and whenever a sign of impending eclampsia is present it and because impending eclampsia develops in a patient of preeclampsia a patient of gestational hypertension will not have eclampsia it is only a patient of preeclampsia who is going to have eclampsia Right, so if instead of moderate headache, if your question gives you severe headache, then again it means you are dealing with preeclampsia because severe headache is a sign of impending eclampsia and just now I will do that with you. So now, now read this question, this is how, you know, our purpose of taking these OPS and gynae clinic or this clinical edges so that we explain to you that how a patient presents to you and same thing can be asked in the form of a question. Right? I'm sure you must be so bored of solving a few MC, uh, you know, MCQs again and again and that is why we are going to make you this a little bit interesting for you where you are going to see a patient and you are going to apply that knowledge into MCQs. Right? So, over here we have a 23 year old G1P0 female with no morbidities who is presenting at 34 weeks of gestation with edema with moderate headache. Her BP at her previous examination was 125.82 and now it is 147.95. Her heart rate is 82, pulse rate is 16, her temperature is 36. A physical examination reveals 2 plus pitting edema in the lower extremities. A urine dipstick shows 2 plus proteinuria. Now, I have got one is high BP and I will check her BP again to be sure that she has hypertension and number two very important information is that she has 2 plus proteinuria which means I am dealing with a case of PIH which could be gestational uh, which means I am dealing with a case of PIH which is preeclampsia. Now please remember that preeclampsia could be mild or it could be severe right. So, a preeclampsia can be a mild preeclampsia or it could be a severe preeclampsia. Now, your question has given you over here a set of investigations, right? A long list of investigations they have given you and they are asking you which lab measurement defines this as a severe form of this patient's condition. So, looking at which lab investigation are you going to say that you are dealing with a case of severe preeclampsia. Now, in order to answer questions like these, you should know what is the difference between mild preeclampsia and severe preeclampsia. Number one is BP criteria. According to BP criteria, if BP is more than equal to 140 by 90 but less than 160 by 110, then you say you are dealing with a case of mild preeclampsia. If BP is more than equal to 160 by 110, then you are dealing with a case of severe preeclampsia. Number two, if there are no signs of end organ damage, then that means you are dealing with a case of mild preeclampsia. If signs of end organ damage are present, that means you are dealing with a case of severe preeclampsia. Now, just now I was telling you that eclampsia is a complication of preeclampsia and which type of preeclampsia? Severe preeclampsia, right? So, if you are getting signs of impending eclampsia, it automatically means that you are dealing with a case of severe preeclampsia because impending eclampsia will be seen only in severe preeclampsia, not in mild preeclampsia, right? So, in this question, based on BP, which is 147 by 90, I cannot say that I am dealing with a case of severe preeclampsia. I have to say that I am dealing with a case of mild preeclampsia. Now they are saying that now based on which criteria should you say that you are dealing with a case of severe preeclampsia. So, just now I am telling you that if signs of end organ damage are present 
or if signs of impending eclampsia are present, then you say you are dealing with severe preeclampsia. So, what are the signs of end organ damage? Signs of end organ damage are if any one of the following are present. Number one, platelet count less than 1 lakh. Number two, liver enzymes more than equal to 2 times the normal value. Number three, serum creatinine more than equal to 1.1. Number 4, pulmonary edema. Number 5, visual uh, symptoms or headache and not any simple headache. It has to be a very severe headache which the patient has never experienced and it should not be relieved by the usual medication. Right. So, this means that if I want to know whether my patient has severe preeclampsia or not, in lab investigations, I have to focus only on three things. Right. Only on three things I have to focus. What are those only three things which you have to focus? Number one, you have to focus on liver enzymes. Number two, you have to focus on platelet count. Number three, you have to focus on serum creatinine. So, please do not focus on this entire list of investigations. You have to just focus on three things and you have to see that in which criteria fits into the criteria of severe preeclampsia. So, let us see liver enzymes. Liver enzymes is... ALT, AST, 6778. So, this definitely fits into the criteria of severe preeclampsia that is uh, liver enzymes raised to two times their normal value. What about platelet count? Platelet count, they have given you thrombocyte count 1,90,000. So, this does not fit into the criteria of severe preeclampsia. In severe preeclampsia, platelet count should be less than 1 lakh. Then number 3 is serum creatinine. Serum creatinine should be more than equal to 1.1. Over here, it is 0 0.9. So, this does not fit into the criteria for severe preeclampsia. Based on her liver enzymes and that is very, very important thing. Whenever you have to say that your patient has signs of end organ damage, not all of them should be present. If even one of them is present, so you say that your patient is a case of severe preeclampsia. Again, I am reminding you, it's not moderate headache which is seen in severe preeclampsia or impending eclampsia. It is a headache which a patient has never experienced in her life before. Right? It will be a very, very severe headache. Now, what are signs of impending eclampsia? Number one, severe preeclampsia. Uh, severe headache, sorry. Number one, severe headache. Number two, visual disturbances. Number three, epigastric pain. And number four, clonus. So, if your patient is complaining of epigastric pain, if she has a severe headache, visual disturbances or if clonus is present, then you come to know that she has impending eclampsia. And even if she have, has any of these symptoms, because it means it is impending eclampsia and because impending eclampsia is a complication of only severe preeclampsia. So, if any one of these is also present, then also I come to know indirectly that I am dealing with a case of severe preeclampsia. So, over here, the answer to this question is liver transaminase. Have you understood? Please don't be swayed by all these investigations. You don't even have to look at them. For severe preeclampsia, uh, to differentiate between severe and mild preeclampsia, you have to look at only three investigations, serum creatinine platelet count and liver enzymes. Is that clear to you? And then you have to look at the various symptoms. Yes? Okay. Now, my next question to you is, how do you manage a case of mild preeclampsia and severe preeclampsia? So, there are certain common points. So, this patient who has come to me, please remember, she is a case of preeclampsia, right? Because proteinuria is present. And rather, she is a case of severe preeclampsia. So, all patients with preeclampsia, you have to admit them, all of them. Why? Even if she is a mild preeclampsia, you have to admit, you have to do lab investigations, uh, you have to do a fundal examination to see that it is, to make sure that it is a case of mild preeclampsia and not severe preeclampsia. As I told you, it is the signs of end organ damage. These all lab investigations which differentiate between mild and severe. So, you will have to admit your patient. You will have to do these lab investigations. You will have to do a fundal examination to know whether you are dealing with mild or severe preeclampsia. That is number one. Number two, PIH or any high-risk pregnancy for that matter, whether it is diabetes, whether it is oligohydramnios, whether it is twin pregnancy, whether it is RH negative pregnancy. In OBS, you have to remember that whenever you are having an any high-risk pregnancy in antenatal period, in all these patients starting from 32 weeks of pregnancy, to all of them, you have to advise fetal monitoring. So, in case of PIH, what all fetal monitoring are you going to do from 32 weeks of pregnancy? Number one, you tell all the females to do a daily fetal movement count. Number one. Number two, you have to, in mild preeclampsia, you have to do NST weekly and biophysical profile weekly. Whereas, in severe preeclampsia, you have to do it daily. Then you have to do an ultrasound for fetal growth. Why? Because in PIH, I am expecting IUGR. So, every three weeks, I have to do ultrasound for fetal growth. 
in case of uh, mild preeclampsia and in case of severe preeclampsia i have to do it every 2 weeks and one more investigation which you have to do in all of them for prognostic purposes umbilical artery doppler this is what you forget so if in your questions they give you that all of the following investigations are done in a patient with mild or severe preeclampsia they give you a list and you have to identify please remember umbilical artery doppler is again telling you whether uteroplacental insufficiency has happened or not so you have to do umbilical artery doppler in patients of pih that is the second thing which you have to remember how to go about with fetal monitoring in all patients who have come to you with pih third thing you have to remember in all these pih patients the best Best method of management is termination of pregnancy right and termination of pregnancy doesn't mean that I'm going to make her abort her pregnancy termination of pregnancy simply means that I am going to tell them for go take them for induction of labor because the uh, best method of delivery in a patient of PIH is vaginal delivery so in whenever I say termination of pregnancy in a patient of PIH it means I'm going to do induction of labor which in case of mild preeclampsia you have to do at 37 weeks in case of severe preeclampsia you have to do at 34 weeks in case of uh, eclampsia in case of impending eclampsia and in case of help syndrome you have to go for immediate termination of pregnancy right then uh, apart from this please remember in case of mild Preeclampsia, antihypertensives are not needed, right? And in case of severe preeclampsia, you have to give them antihypertensives and you have to give them magnesium sulfate. Why magnesium sulfate? To prevent them from having eclampsia, right? So, uh, this is how you have to manage mild preeclampsia and a case of severe preeclampsia. Mild preeclampsia ka patient after you have initially admitted them and you have ruled out that they don't have severe preeclampsia, you can discharge them and you can give them this advice that every day they are going to get their BP measured twice, right? And whereas severe preeclampsia, you should they should remain admitted with you because they have chances of throwing convulsions, they have chances of having help syndrome and various complications. So we don't discharge a severe preeclampsia patient. She should be managed as IPD patient, right? Then comes your third patient. So second patient we've dealt. In second patient, uh, we saw that uh, she was a case of PIH. Now comes question number three. A 27-year-old woman, Gravida 1, Para 0, presents at 16 weeks of gestation. So now into our clinics, a G2P1 female has come who is 16 weeks of gestation and she's come for a routine prenatal visit. Her past medical history is unremarkable. She takes 500 micrograms of folic acid and 60 milligrams of iron daily, which means that I have already put her on the... Uh, you know, Anemia Mukt Bharat program. As per Anemia Mukt Bharat program, starting from fourth month of pregnancy, I have put her on 60 milligrams of iron and 500 micrograms of folic acid, which means just now everything is happening right. Now, she is feeling well and she has come to get her triple test result reviewed. Now, all of you know that for adnuploiding screening has to be advised to all pregnant females. So, it is a universal screening irrespective of the age of the mother. So, in this patient, in the previous visit, when both of us saw this patient, we advised her to get a triple test done and we told her that next time when you are coming, get the reports for us, right? So, uh, this patient has now come for her report to be reviewed. So, let us re review her report. Her maternal alpha fetoprotein levels are 2.9 mOm. Reference value is 0.85 to 2.5 mOm, which means that her alpha fetoprotein levels are increased. Beta HCG is 1 mo mOm. Uh, the mOm is multiples of meridian and reference value is 0.5 to 1. So, if it is 0.5 to 1, my patient has 1 mOm, which means beta HCG values are normal. Unconjugated estriol in my patient is 1 and the reference value is between 0.5 to 3 which means unconjugated estriol is normal. Right. Now first tell me you are looking at this test result. What interpretation are you making? This is what is a triple test result. Right. Now if it is a triple test result let us see what is what sense is it making. Now in a patient of trisomy, what do you expect? In a patient of trisomy, I expect alpha fetoprotein levels to be less, unconjugated estriol levels to be less and beta HCG levels to be high. And just in case I do inhibin A, which makes it a 
uh, quad test and quad test is better it is rather more commonly performed it is better test than triple test I will see inhibin A levels are high and if you remember in your marrow videos I have told you that in case of down syndrome all markers are decreased all markers are decreased except for two markers H for HCG, H for high and I for inhibin, I for high, uh, I for increased. H for HCG, H for high, I for inhibin and I for increased. Right, so there are two biochemical markers in a patient of Down syndrome which are increased. The rest all of them are decreased. So this means that in quadruple test when you are testing for alpha fetoprotein, alpha fetoprotein should be less, E3 levels should be less, HCG should be high, inhibin A should be high. Which means that in our patient, what are we getting? In our patient, HCG levels are normal, E3 levels are normal, so it cannot be a case of trisomy 21 right number two look over here what happens in case of trisomy 18 in case of trisomy 18 all the markers are low now because in trisomy 18 all markers are low again it cannot be a case of trisomy 18 so i'm not suspecting trisomy 18 then comes neural tube defects what happens in neural tube defects in neural tube defects you get isolated increase in alpha fetoprotein levels whereas unconjugated estrogen inhibin and HCG all of them will be normal and this is exactly the picture which I am getting in my patient this means what am I suspecting I am suspecting that she could be a case of neural tube defect as far as multiple gestations are concerned in multiple gestations alpha fetoprotein level are high and HCG levels are high right whereas unconjugated E3 and inhibin A levels are normal we all know that HCG is produced by syncytial trophoblast and alpha fetoprotein is produced by fetal yolk sac and liver now in case of multifetal pregnancy there are two yolk sacs two livers two GITs which are producing alpha fetoprotein so yes alpha fetoprotein levels would be high and because there is more trophoblast there are two placentas that is why HCG levels are high right so uh, based on this I come to say that this I am not dealing with a case of Down syndrome. I am dealing probably with a case of neural tube defect or abdominal wall defect because whenever alpha, alpha, alpha fetoprotein levels are high, either it is a case of neural tube defect or it is a case of abdominal wall defect. And how can you distinguish between them? The best and the uh, best screening test and best diagnostic test for neural tube defects is ultrasound. Please remember, so whenever you are suspecting neural tube defect, whenever you are suspecting any gross congenital anomaly, that gross congenital anomaly could be neural tube defect, that gross congenital anomaly could be abdominal wall defect. So whenever you are suspecting any gross congenital anomaly, then the investigation which you have to do is ultrasound and that becomes your screening as well as your diagnostic test. Now in case of neural tube defects earlier, when ultrasound facility was not that great at that time the screening test was maternal serum alpha fetoprotein level which was done between 15 to 20 weeks and earlier the diagnostic test was amniocentesis but now it is not now it has to be ultrasound so when in this case i am getting that there is increased alpha fetoprotein level in my patient what am i suspecting i'm suspecting either it's a neural tube defect or abdominal wall defect so common sense tells me that now what are both of us going to do what are we going to advise her we are going to advise her that get an ultrasound done right so if this comes to you in the form of mcq then also you know they are going to ask you this question which of the following is the most appropriate next step in management so the most appropriate next step in management becomes ultrasound examination i hope this is clear to you right now quickly uh, you should also know everything about aneuploidy screening you should know what are the tests done for aneuploidy screening in first trimester what are the tests done for aneuploidy screening in second trimester right so all that becomes very very important for all of you aneuploidy screening is an important topic not only from clinical practice point of view also from your mcq's point of view right so now let's call in our next patient our next patient is g2p1 female who's come to you at 24 weeks of pregnancy she comes for antenatal examination and when you did her per abdominal examination her symphysiofundal height is 20 centimeters now 
what could be the cause that she is 24 weeks pregnant and you are getting the height as 20 centimeters that is one thing one aspect of their question the second is that if height is coming low how am i going to proceed with the diagnosis what all complications can happen in this patient and how are you going to manage your patient so this is something which we need to discuss we need to know whenever a patient comes where the height of the uh, uterus and the period of gestation are not corresponding to each other so please remember as per NICE guidelines, symphysofundal height should be measured in all pregnant females between 24 to 36 weeks of pregnancy and symphysofundal height, it corresponds to gestational age between this time. Now there are certain cases where symphysofundal height will not be measured. For example, number one, if I know my patient has a, is a case of transverse lie. In transverse lie, the symphysofundal height will definitely be decreased than the period of gestation. Number two, in case of over distended uteruses or in a known case of fibroid. So, if I know she is a case of fibroid, in that case also, I am not going to check her height of uh, uterus, uh, whether it is corresponding to the period of gestation or not, right? So, whenever the height of a patient is not corresponding to the gestational age and suppose the height is more than the period of gestation, what all possibilities you have to keep in mind? Number one, you have to keep the possibility of a full bladder in mind. That is why whenever you are measuring symphysofundal height, bacho, it is very important that you tell your patient to, pray, uh, to empty her bladder. That is number one. Number two, it could be a case of mistaken dates. Number three, it could be a multifetal pregnancy, diabetic patients, polyhydramnios, or it could be a case of concealed variety of abruptio, molar pregnancy or macrosomia. So, these are very common reasons for height of the uterus more than the period of gestation. Similarly, what are the conditions in which height of the uterus is less than the period of gestation? Again, we have wrong dates, then it could be IUGR, intrauterine death of the fetus, PIH, oligohydramnios or premature rupture of membranes. Now comes a very important question that since mistaken dates is also one of the reasons for height of the uterus not corresponding to period of gestation. So, when I am going to suspect mistaken dates and when am I going to suspect a pathological cause for oligo or uh, polyhydramnia. So, whenever the difference in period of gestation and the difference between period of gestation and symphysiofundal height is more than equal to 3 centimeters. Right, so whenever the difference between period of gestation and symphysofundal height is more than equal to 3 centimeters, in that case, in other words, it is more than equal to 3 weeks. Right, this is the time when you should not be suspecting a mistaken date. This means there is some pathological cause for this difference in symphysofundal height. Right, so now in my patient, look. In our patient, what has happened? In our patient, symphysofundal height is 20 centimeters. She is 24 weeks. That means the difference is more than equal to uh, 3 centimeters. So, I am not suspecting a mistaken dates. Now, whenever I am not suspecting a mistaken dates, what am I going to do next? Whenever I get a difference of more than equal to 3 weeks on per abdominal examination, whenever you get a difference of more than equal to 3 weeks, number one, you have to do is Number one thing you have to check is whether it is a case of mild oligo or whether it is a case of uh, uh, severe oligo or mild poly or severe poly. How are you going to know to that? You are going to know that by doing a on ultrasound a level one scan. So obviously, whenever the symphysofundal height is decreased or increased and that is more than equal to three centimeters, then the first step which you have to do is a level one scan. Right, a level 1 scan is going to tell you details about amniotic fluid index and it is going to tell you what is the single largest vertical pocket. Amniotic fluid index, normally what is the range? Normally amniotic fluid index is between 5 to 24 centimeters and single largest vertical pocket is between 2 to 8 centimeters. Right. So, if I am getting on a level 1 ultrasound, I am getting that there is mild oligo or I am getting mild poly. In that case, no further evaluation is needed. Right. But if your level 1 ultrasound is showing you, no, there is not, it is not just mild, it is either moderate or it is severe. So, in case of moderate or severe polyhydramnios, remember the most common cause most common cause is gross congenital anomalies of the fetus. Now, which, which gross congenital anomaly can lead to oligohydramnios? Renal anomalies. Which gross congenital anomalies can lead to polyhydramnios? GI abnormalities. 
right so now all of you know that whenever you want to check gross congenital anomalies then the ultrasound of choice is a target scan or an anomaly scan so once i am i have seen that it is a case of moderate or severe oligo or mod, uh, then in that case my next step becomes that i am going to do a target scan now on target scan what i want to see i want to see whether gross congenital anomalies are present or not now again if gross congenital anomalies are seen then my next step becomes karyotyping right so whenever gross congenital anomalies are seen and you, there is moderate to severe oligo or polyhydramnios then the next step becomes karyotyping but if gross congenital anomalies are not seen then i have to rule out other causes of oligo and other causes of poly what are the other causes of oligo for example premature rupture of membranes so when i have to check whether there is pre term premature rupture of membranes how do you take check that by doing a sterile per speculum examination then i have to rule out utero placental insufficiency for utero and uh, placental insufficiency the investigation of choices i'm like a artery doppler in i'm like a artery doppler i have to look at the sd ratio right in case of um, uh, utero placental insufficiency this sd ratio becomes more than equal to 3 so you have to do an umbilical artery doppler in case of oligohydramnios you have to rule out preterm premature rupture of membranes also it could be that she or patient is taking some drugs like endomethacin that is why there is oligohydramnios so rule out all those things now if it is a case of polyhydramnios and gross congenital anomalies are absent then in that case check ke kahi your patient doesn't have diabetes see level 1 scan would have told you ki twins hai ki nahi hai right so now you have to check whether your patient doesn't have, have diabetes or not and for diabetes you have to go for a dipsy scan then other than that anemia is a very fetal anemia is a very important cause of polyhydramnios and what uh, doppler do you do to check fetal anemia whenever you want to check fetal anemia you have to do peak systolic velocity of middle cerebral artery so in case of polyhydramnios i'm going to follow the dipsy criteria to see whether my patient has diabetes or not and number 2 i am going to do a peak systolic i am going to check the peak systolic velocity of middle cerebral artery to rule out fetal anemias right so this is a step wise algorithm which you have to follow if your patient is coming to you with discrepancy in symphysofundal height and period of gestation right now they are saying that in your patient how are you going to proceed with the diagnosis this we have done what all complications can occur in this patient so your patient is a case of oligohydramnios once you see that she is a case of uh, oligohydramnios you have to explain to the patient what all complications can occur in her now if oligohydramnios occurs in first trimester oligo the amniotic fluid what is the role of amniotic fluid in over here the most important role is that it is going to stretch the uterus in other words it gives space for the fetal organs to grow so if oligohydramnios happens in first trimester the most common complication which you get is pulmonary hyperplasia hypoplasia right the lungs of the baby don't develop or it can lead to limb reduction defects right now if oligohydramnios happens in second or third trimester now if oligohydramnios is happening in second or third trimester by that time organogenesis is already over so in that case the problem which happens in the baby is because there is less space it leads to cord compression right and this cord compression will lead to fetal distress and all of you know that whenever there is fetal distress fetal spart passes meconium into the amniotic fluid and you also know that fetus swallows amniotic fluid that is how amniotic fluid is kept in balance because fetus on one side produces amniotic amniotic fluid in the form of urine and on the other hand it swallows amniotic fluid so if fetus has passed meconium in amniotic fluid it is going to result in meconium aspiration syndrome the other problem which can happen is limb deformities like cteb or clubfoot so these are the complications which can uh, happen in your patient right so this means that when you are getting moderate to severe oligo or when you are getting moderate to severe polyhydramnios both of them are high risk pregnancies and whenever you get a patient of high risk pregnancies how do you do the monitoring just now i told you that in entire ops whenever you get a patient of high risk pregnancy be it pih diabetes oligohydramnios twins you have to start their fetal monitoring starting from 32 weeks of pregnancy then depending upon the complication you have to go for nst weekly or you have to go for bio uh, or daily in case of oligohydramnios you have to do nst weekly in some cases you might have to do nst twice weekly so that depends upon the pregnancy condition. condition in some conditions you have to do nst weekly in some you have to do twice weekly in some you have to do daily
right so in case of oligohydramnios we have to do nst weekly and we have to do biophysical score weekly another thing which you should remember is one very important investigation which we tend to forget one of the important causes of oligohydramnios is utroplacental insufficiency right so in patients of oligohydramnios i have to check their umbilical artery doppler and i have to monitor the utroplacental insufficiency the other important thing is if they ask you what is the most common ctg finding which you get in a patient of oligohydramnios first rather than going to what is the most common ctg finding what all are the ctg findings which you can get in a patient of oligohydramnios now in a patient of oligohydramnios cord compression can happen whenever there is cord compression the ctg finding which you get or uh, is uh, always variable deceleration so in a patient of oligohydramnios you can get variable deceleration in a patient of premature rupture of membranes you can get uh, variable decelerations right now number 2 just now i was telling you that one of the important causes of oligohydramnios is utroplacental insufficiency and when there is utroplacental insufficiency it leads to day late decelerations uh on ctg this means that in a patient of oligohydramnios on ctg i can either get variable deceleration or i can get late deceleration so now the important thing is which is the more common uh, most common ctg finding in a patient of oligohydramnios most common is variable deceleration now whenever you get a patient of oligohydramnios what is the management please remember management is i have to maintain mother's hydration maintain maternal hydration there is nothing much which i can do in a patient of oligohydramnios one of the options is i can go for amino infusion that is infusing normal saline but then what is the indication for amino infusion there is only one indication for amino infusion and that is if there is persistent variable deceleration on ctg now at what time are you going to terminate pregnancy in patients of oligohydramnios mild oligohydramnios you are going to terminate pregnancy at 39 weeks and in case of moderate to severe oligohydramnios or if complications are present then at 36 between 36 to 37 weeks now one thing which i want to all of you to remember see in a uh, pregnancy it is very imp- in obs it is very important for you to remember that at what time termination of pregnancy has to be done now although i recommend that in patients of pih in various conditions in diabetes in various conditions you should remember exactly at what time period of uh, at what ter- period of pregnancy termination is done but suppose a condition comes which you don't know about right you don't know about that condition and you've forgotten that at what time termination of pregnancy occurs then you have to be very smart in all those conditions where it is an uncomplicated pregnancy or complications are less in that case the smarter answer to mark is that i am going to terminate pregnancy at 39 weeks right for instance over here if there is mild oligohydramnios then i'm going to say i'm going to terminate her pregnancy at 39 weeks but if you get a severe um, uh, condition a condition which leads to complications right in that case the smarter answer to mark is that i'm going to terminate pregnancy between 36 to 37 weeks like over here if it is a case of moderate to severe uh, oligohydramnios or if it is a case of uh, if complications are present i'm going to say 36 to 37 weeks same goes for polyhydramnios in mild polyhydramnios i will terminate her pregnancy at around 39 weeks and in case of moderate to severe polyhydramnios or if complications are present i'm going to terminate her pregnancy between 36 to 37 weeks similar was for diabetes in diabetes patients if there are no complications if a diabetes is well controlled you terminate pregnancy at 39 weeks if diabetes is not well controlled or complications are present you terminate pregnancy between 36 to 37 weeks right so this is a general thing which you have to remember but then other than that you have to remember that at what period of gestation pregnancy is terminated in patients of pih all those conditions are very very important and uh, if you believe me uh this is one thing which should go in your 20th notebook if all of you are making a 20th notebook then in in your 20th notebook on one side write down uh pregnancy condition make a table pregnancy condition on the other side at what period of gestation termination of pregnancy is done right okay so have you understood that what do you have to do when a patient of uh, oligohydramnios comes to you how do you proceed with the diagnosis what all complications can happen and how are you going to manage right it is a high risk pregnancy so you have to do fetal monitoring right 
Now a patient of vomiting is coming to you and that's a very very common complaint with which a patient a pregnant patient is going to come to you. So as a clinician it is very important for you to know whether you are dealing with the normal vomiting in pregnancy the physiological vomiting in pregnancy which is called as the morning sickness or are you dealing with hyper emesis gravidarum. So let's call in a patient who is having vomiting in pregnancy. A 25 year old G1 P0 woman at 22 weeks of gestation based on her last menstrual period has presented to the emergency department because of persistent vomiting in the past 8 weeks. So imagine 22 weeks per patient is coming to you and she is having persistent vomiting for 8 weeks. That's a very important history which she has given you. Right? Just now I will tell you the significance of this history. She has lost 3.5 kgs of unintentional weight loss. So this is unintentional weight loss which has happened and 3.5 kgs weight is lost. Then she had took a home pregnancy test several months ago. She has not been on any prenatal care. Very important history again, she has not been on any prenatal care, she has lost 3.5 kgs weight, she has come to you at 22 weeks of gestation. She reports having tried diet modification and over the counter remedies with no improvement, patient's BP is 102 by 75, pulse rate is 90, respiratory rate is 16, temperature is 36, physical examination reveals an anxious, fatigued appearing young woman with no abnormal findings. So. Uh, how do you come to know that the vomiting which a female is having physiological? See, most of the pregnant females are going to experience vomiting and this vomiting is happening because of hormone HCG mainly. But it is not just because of HCG, it is because of hormones like HCG, estrogen and progesterone. And this physiological vomiting which you call as the morning sickness, the typical time for this vomiting to begin is around 5 to 6 weeks of pregnancy. And that is the time when HCG appears in blood and that is the time when a female will start having some vomiting. Now as the HCG levels are going to increase, her vomiting is going to increase slightly and so maximum uh, HCG levels are seen at 10 weeks of pregnancy. So maximum vomiting and maximum nausea she is going to have around 10 weeks of pregnancy. Then we all know that after 10 weeks of pregnancy, the levels of HCG start dropping and minimum HCG levels are seen by 16 weeks and then at a very low level, HCG persists throughout pregnancy. So same thing is going to be seen with her vomiting. Her vomiting appeared around 5 to 6 weeks of pregnancy. It peaked and it was maximum at 10 weeks of pregnancy and by 16 weeks of pregnancy, the vomiting subsides. Right. So this one history which she is saying that she is 22 weeks pregnant and her vomiting started just 8 weeks back. This is not normal. Number one. Number two, in case of morning sickness, see, although we call this vomiting as morning sickness, but the, uh, this is because it is slightly more in the morning hours. But that doesn't mean that a pregnant female will have vomiting only during the morning hours, right? But irrespective of the fact how much vomiting she is having, her physical examination, vital signs, investigations all remain normal and physiological vomiting which is the morning sickness, it doesn't lead to weight loss. That's a very, very important criteria, right? So if your patient is having uh, you know, there is no, um, uh, there are no white changes in vital signs, her lab abnormalities, her, her lab tests are absolutely normal, no weight loss and we know and it is corresponding to what I taught you about physiological uh, changes, uh, physiological vomiting. Then what management are you going to give? Then in that case, you have to recommend to her certain dietary modifications. So before you say that I'm going to start any drug treatment, explain to her certain dietary modifications like tell her to consume small frequent meals every two hours do not overfull her stomach, consume snacks before rising from bed. That's very important to all my patients. What I tell them is that uh, when they are lying down, we know all pregnant females that before you go to bed, keep a biscuit near your bedside and a glass of water. In the morning may when you get up, have two biscuits, have some water and then you put your foot down and then go for brushing off your teeth. Before going, uh, getting up from your bed, you should have some light snacks and that prevents vomiting. Right? Then avoid sleeping or lying down immediately after meals and avoid spicy fatty food. These are the general things which we tell to all females who are experiencing vomiting in pregnancy. Now, the drug of choice which you have to start, the first drug which you give whenever a female comes to you with vomiting is pyridoxin and the starting dose will be 10 mg. You are going to repeat it every 6 to 8 hours and maximum you can give 200 mg per day. If her vomiting is not relieved by pyridoxin, then you are going to add doxylamine. So it will be pyridoxin and doxylamine combination which you are going to give 10 mg, 2 tablets at night.
right then uh, diphenhyd and if the vomiting doesn't resol uh, re uh, resolve by given pyridoxin and doxylamine then you go to diphenhydrinate or diphenhydramine so that is how you uh, manage vomiting in pregnancy which is the morning sickness now what about hyperemesis gravidarum so what is the diagnostic criteria for hyperemesis gravidarum? The diagnostic criteria for hyperemesis gravidarum is that your patient is having severe nausea and vomiting. There is weight loss which is happening which is around 3 kgs of weight loss or more than equal to 5% of a pre-pregnancy weight and she is having ketonuria. If these things are present then you say that it is hyperemesis gravidarum and hyperemesis gravidarum it leads to lab abnormalities. For example, when you check her serum electrolytes you are going to get hyponatremia, uh, you are to get hypokalemia or metabolic acidosis so in case of hyperemesis gravidarum there will be hypokalemia or metabolic acidosis then there is going to be hemoconcentration when you do a cbc you are going to get hemoconcentration all of you know that normally in pregnancy there is hemodilution but in a patient who's having hyperemesis gravidarum you're going to get hemoconcentration then check her serum creatinine levels do an ultrasound why doing ultrasound is important because i want to know number one whether the fetus is viable or not number two i want to know the number of uh, fetuses whether it is a multifetal pregnancy or a twin pregnancy or it is a molar pregnancy because one of the very important reasons for hyperemesis gravidarum is molar pregnancy so before i start giving her treatment i have to rule out molar pregnancy because uh, you know molar pregnancy the treatment is you have to go for suction evacuation right then you have to assess for complications like mallory v syndrome or like wernicke's encephalopathy so whenever a patient of hyperemesis gravidarum comes to you all these investigations you have to do serum electrolyte serum creatinine cbc ultrasound and rule out for complications Right now, once you've done this, then how do you manage a patient of hyperemesis gravidarum? Admit them, give them IV fluids, give them H2 antagonists like ranitidine that is going to prevent the acid reflux from happening, right? And give her thiamine. Now, when it comes to antiemetics, this was general what we were doing IV fluids, anti, um, thiamine, and then uh, H2 antagonists. That this is general thing, but as far as antiemetics are concerned, what antiemetics are you going to give her? That depends upon whether there is there are signs of hypovolemia or not. If hypovolemia is absent, then I can give her oral drugs like diphenhydramine, diamonhydrinate, and if that fails, I can go to metoclopramide, and if that fails, then I go to ondansetron, which becomes my last resort right but if your patient is having hypovolemia then you have to start with iv on citron clear to all of you yes okay so now suppose this comes in the form of an mcq to you how are you going to apply this knowledge which i have taught you when an mcq is asked so over here again it's the same female who's come to you at 22 weeks of gestation and there is a five and a half kgs of unintentional weight loss she took home pregnancy test several months ago and she did not have any prenatal care that's very very important right then we are seeing that her vitals she is moving towards hypovolemia she has 100 her bp is 102 by 75 pulse rate is 90 respiratory rate is 16 then physical examination reveals an anxious and fatigued appearing young woman with no abnormal findings in addition to starting now your question is saying in addition to starting IV hydration and checking her electrolytes what is the most important step in her management so you tell me they are telling you they are telling you that yes you have to start IV fluid in her she is having hypovolemia you have to check her serum electrolytes right but other than that what else is an important step in her now this patient agree now let's first see the options the options are option a obtain an uh, abdominal ultrasound option b obtain a beta hcg and transvaginal ultrasound option c begin treatment with vitamin b6 option d administer metoclopramide option e order a ct scan so sabse pehle do, let's rule out it cannot be order a ct scan right now be begin treatment with vitamin b6 again that is one of the steps which i am going to do if there is wernicke's encephalopathy but that is not the major step which has to be done over here now comes the option uh, about ultrasound and about metaclopramide so please understand that this patient did not have any prenatal care she has come to you with hyperemesis gravidarum administering her a drug is important but then before that it is important to know whether she has molar pregnancy whether she has multifetal pregnancy right because if she has a molar pregnancy then i have to answer it as that i want to do a suction evacuation 
So first of all, rule out molar pregnancy, rule out twin pregnancy. And for that, you have two options, obtain abdominal ultrasound or obtain a beta HCG and transvaginal ultrasound. The better answer will be obtain beta HCG and a transvaginal ultrasound, right? Beta HCG levels in a case of molar pregnancy, they are very, very high. They are generally more than equal to 10 to the power of 5 international units. And in case and uh, when you do a transvaginal ultrasound, you are going to get a snowstorm like appearance. Now, also remember that this patient is showing you some signs of hypovolemia. And whenever a patient shows you signs of hypovolemia, the drug of choice is ondansetron. It is not metaclopramide and that is why again it is not metaclopramide. So my best answer over here is first I want to rule out molar pregnancy. I want to see that the hyperemesis gravidarum is not because of molar pregnancy. I also want to rule out twin pregnancy and then I am going to start with the drug medications. Clear to all of you? Right? Chalo, let's call our next patient. Our next patient is a G2P1 female with 5 weeks of amenorrhea. So, she has 5 weeks of amenorrhea, right? And uh, her urine pregnancy test is positive. She is complaining of spotting. Her T you order a TVS after her spotting, uh, spotting stop. So, you tell her, it's okay. Just now you are having spotting. Go home, take rest. And once the spotting stops, you come, uh, you get an ultrasound and then show me your report. Now, her ultrasound report is showing that she has a G sac of 18 millimeters size. Yolk sac is absent. Fetal pole is absent. And cardiac activity is absent. What is the next step in management? Options given to you are tab mesoprost 400 micrograms and mifepristone 200 milligrams. Tab mesoprost 800 micrograms and mifepristone 200 milligrams. Continue folic acid and repeat ultrasound after one week. That's option C. Option D, suction evacuation. Option E, manual vacuum aspiration. So whenever a patient is coming to me with bleeding PV in first trimester, right? And if, you know, in first trimesters, whenever a patient comes to you with bleeding, then one of the very important investigations other than urine pregnancy test is ultrasounds, right? So, I have to get an ultrasound done in her and I tell her that once the spotting stops, you get an ultrasound for me. Now, in early pregnancy, this is the sequence in which structures are seen on ultrasound and I am sure all of you know that. Number one is uh, gestational sac. The first structure to appear is gestational sac. This is followed by yolk sac. This is followed by fetal pole. Once fetal pole is seen, then you can measure the crown rump length and then cardiac activity appears. Now, a very important thing which you have to remember, which I have taught in, to you, all of you in the OBS radio integration in MARO, that what are the important cutoff values? Right. So, what is the cutoff value of gestational sac to visualize a fetal pole? The cutoff value is 25 millimeters. What do you mean by this? This means that if gestational sac is 25 millimeters and still you cannot see a yolk sac, that means it is a case of missed abortion. But if gestational sac is less than 25 millimeters and you cannot see a fetal pole, in that case, before you say it is a missed abortion, you have to repeat her ultrasound after one week, right? Repeat her ultrasound after one week, then don't say it is a case of missed abortion because the cutoff value of gestational sac, that is mean sac diameter. They might not give you the gestational sac as a word, they may say mean sac diameter. So, the cutoff value of mean sac diameter to visualize fetal pole is 25 millimeters, right? Number two, cutoff value of crown rump length to get cardiac activity. Just now we saw that after crown rump length appears, cardiac activity is going to appear after that. So, now the what is the cutoff value of crown rump length to get cardiac activity? So, the cutoff value of crown rump length to get a cardiac activity is 7 millimeters, which means if crown rump length is more than 7 millimeters and cardiac activity has it come, then that is a criteria for missed abortion, right? Number three important thing is, suppose if gestational sac is present, now I am telling you that suppose a gestational sac is present, a yolk sac is present, how long are you going to wait for the fetal pole to appear? So, if yes, gestational sac and yolk sac are present, then you have to wait for 11 days for fetal pole to appear. If in 11 days a fetal pole is not appearing, then you say this is a case of missed abortion. On the other hand, if gestational sac is present but yolk sac is absent, 
then in that case you are going to say it is a case of missed abortion after waiting for a period of 14 days for the fetal pole or cardiac activity to appear right so these are all very important cutoff values they are asked directly or indirectly in all your exams number two as a clinician you know we are gynecologists but for everything we are not going to depend upon radiologists right so as a gynecologist i should know that what are the important cutoff values of all these things one more cutoff value which is very very important for all of you to know is what is the cutoff value of beta hcg to visualize gestational sac inside the uterus in an intrauterine pregnancy and this is what is called as critical titer critical titer is that value of hcg and which in all intrauterine pregnancies when you do an ultrasound, you should be able to see a gestational sac and that value for TVS is 2000 international unit and for trans abdominal ultrasound, it is 6500 international units, right? So, these informations are very, very important for your exam point of view, also from a clinician point of view. So, now if I ask you that how do you diagnose a missed abortion, you will say that there are four criteria to diagnose missed abortion. Number one and the best criteria is if mean sac diameter is more than equal to 25 millimeters and a fetal pole is not seen. Or number two, if crown rump length is more than equal to 7 millimeters and cardiac activity not seen. And then the other two criteria which I told you. Right now, if on ultrasound missed abortion is confirmed and this missed abortion is happening at less than seven weeks, then your next step becomes medical abortion. But if uh, this missed abortion is between seven to 12 weeks, then the best management is suction evacuation. If missed abortion is not confirmed, this is if missed abortion confirmed on ultrasound by using the above criteria. Missed abortion if it is confirmed on ultrasound. So, by using these criteria, if missed abortion is confirmed on ultrasound, then your next step becomes that I have to manage the missed abortion. And how do you manage missed abortion? At less than 7 weeks, go for medical abortion. At between 7 to 12 weeks, go for suction evacuation. But if missed abortion is not confirmed on ultrasound, missed abortion is not confirmed. In that case, please don't say that I am going to manage the missed abortion. In that case, your next step becomes that I am going to repeat the ultrasound after one week. Repeat the ultrasound after one week. Are you understanding this, all of you? So now in this patient who is brought to me the report of her ultrasound, gestational sac is 18 millimeters and we cannot see a fetal pole. Right, the cutoff value to see a fetal pole was 25 millimeters. So, this means it is not a confirmed case of missed abortion. So, if it is not a confirmed case of missed abortion, what am I going to do? I am going to continue her folic acid and repeat ultrasound after one week. Have you all understood this? Now, let us call our next patient. Our next patient again is a G2P0 patient right, who comes for preconceptional care. So, she is a G2P0 patient. She is coming for preconceptional care. So, she is not pregnant just now. She has history of previous two second trimester abortions which were spontaneous and painless. She is anxious about her next pregnancy and very rightly, I mean, she is going to be anxious if a female has had two previous second trimester abortions, that female ought to be anxious, right? Now, my question to you is, what are the causes of recurrent pregnancy loss? First of all, you are going to tell me the causes of recurrent pregnancy loss. We are going to discuss that. We are going to discuss what is a recurrent pregnancy loss. What are the causes of recurrent pregnancy loss? And how do you investigate a case of recurrent pregnancy loss? And then we are going to talk about this particular case, right? So, how do you define a recurrent pregnancy loss? The conventional definition for recurrent pregnancy loss is if there are three or more than three uh, spontaneous uh, losses, then that is called as a recurrent pregnancy loss. Now, recently ASRM has said that if you have a patient who has previous two histories of abortions and these were uh, confirmed, you know, these were confirmed cases of pregnancies which were confirmed either by ultrasound or by histopathological examination, then you should start evaluating them. You should not wait for a third pregnancy loss to happen before you evaluate them. 
right now there are four established causes for recurrent pregnancy losses number one the single most important cause of recurrent pregnancy losses apla syndrome right number two are uterine structural anomalies for example septate uterus biconvate uterus incompetent uterus right fibroid uterus um, all Asherman syndrome so these are all uterine anomalies which can lead to recurrent pregnancy loss number three are chromosomal ab abnormalities now these chromosomal abnormalities are parental chromosomal abnormality and the chromosomal abnormality which can lead to recurrent pregnancy loss this is which is happening in the parent and this is balanced translocation of chromosome right so balanced translocation of chromosome in either of the two parents can lead to recurrent pregnancy loss and number four we have hypothyroidism remember infections never lead to recurrent pregnancy loss so the four established causes of recurrent pregnancy losses are apla syndrome number two uterine anomalies number three so carry uh, your your chromosomal anomalies chromosomal anomalies are leading to only four percent cases of recurrent pregnancy loss whereas when we are talking about a single a pregnancy loss then chromosomal anomalies were the most common causes of isolated abortions but when it comes to recurrent pregnancy loss then chromosomal anomalies and that two of the parents they lead to only four percent cases of recurrent pregnancy loss and number four we have hypothyroidism or we have endocrinopathies so as a group please remember that as a group it is the endocrinopathies which is most commonly leading to recurrent pregnancy loss in comparison to uterine anomalies in endocrinopathies we have you know hypothyroidism which leads to recurrent pregnancy loss then uncontrolled diabetes uncontrolled diabetes can lead to recurrent pregnancy loss conditions like pcos may lead to recurrent pregnancy loss then a luteal phase defect plus minus it may lead to recurrent pregnancy loss but as a group the most common group which can lead to recurrent pregnancy loss is endocrinopathies is this clear to all of you yes now but when it comes to the most common single cause if they ask you most common single cause which leads to which leads to recurrent pregnancy loss then it is apla syndrome right now keeping this in mind what are the investigations which we are going to order for recurrent pregnancy loss number one we are going to order ultrasound uterus because uterine anomalies are uh, like fibroid then um, uh, incompetent os then your septate uterus biconvate uterus all of them can lead to recurrent pregnancy loss number two i'm going to get apla antibodies tested number three i'm going to get a parental karyotyping done and number four tsh in this the order of investigations should be get ultrasound uterus done first because it can detect a number of problems right then you should go for apla antibodies then or you should also go for tsh uh, and parental karyotype should be the last one to order now in a patient of uh, recurrent pregnancy loss are you going to get a torch testing done no torch testing should never be done because uh, no infections leads to recurrent pregnancy loss right so if this is clear to you let us proceed with our case so a g2p1 same case i have made it in the form of a question now for all of you yes so a g2p1 female comes for preconceptual care she has history of previous two second trimester abortions occurring at 16 weeks and 14 weeks respectively which were spontaneous and painless she's anxious about her next pregnancy all are true for management of this condition so first tell me whenever a patient comes to you with history of two second trimester pregnancy losses which are painless what is the cause which comes to your mind immediately cervical incompetence should come to your mind right whenever a patient comes to you with history of previous two second trimester abortions it means it is a confirmed case of cervical incompetence right there is no need for tvs no need that i'm going to do a tvs to know whether cervical incompetence has happened or not based on her history this is what is called as history based diagnosis based on her history i can be very sure that this is a case of cervical incompetence right so now this patient who is very anxious asks me that uh 
am I going to get an, some investigation done? You could say no. No need for any investigation. I have made the diagnosis. You are a case of cervical incompetence. Chalo, diagnosis ban gaya. Now patient is more worried about the management. So can you do something for managing cervical incompetence in the non-pregnant states? Definitely. In this condition, when the patient has come to you during her non-pregnant state, the management you can do management of cervical incompetence and the surgery which you do one is a vaginal surgery remember the name of the surgery this is lash and lash procedure so you can do a lash and lash procedure now lash and lash procedure may what we do is we are taking the defective cervix and we are cutting it right and then we are applying sutures so whenever we perform a lash and a lash surgery we tell our patient that she should not conceive within three months of the procedure within three months of the procedure she should not be conceiving that's very very important right lash and lash surgery can be done only during pregnancy uh, only during non-pregnant states only during non-pregnant states and that was your one of the INI set questions. They had asked you once that in non-pregnant females which of the following cervical circlage can be performed, right? So the answer to that question was lash and lash surgery. Number two, during non-pregnant states you can also go for abdominal laparoscopic method abdominal laparoscopic method now whenever you are doing abdominal laparoscopic method you are applying a circlage you are applying a stitch what is a circlage it's a stitch right so you are applying a circlage and you are tightening the cervix and then you are telling this female whenever you do abdominal circlage that we are going to remove the stitch once her entire uh, you know uh, Childbearing is over. Once she has completed her family, then you have to remove the stitch. Whereas, whenever we do vaginal circlage surgeries, just now I'll be talking to you about vaginal circlage surgeries done during pregnancy. So, whenever you do a vaginal circlage surgery, because you've done, you've applied the stitch vaginally, you will remove the stitch and proceed with vaginal delivery. But whenever you do an abdominal circlage surgery, you have applied the stitch abdominally. So, now you are not going to do a vaginal delivery you are not going to remove the stitch simply when the patient conceives and when she has time to when time comes for her delivery you are going to do a cesarean section you do not so when the patient conceives i am sorry for the poor handwriting which i have so do not remove the stitch till her entire Childbearing is over. Clear to all of you? Now, these are the two surgeries which you can do in non-pregnant states. Now, when the same patient conceives, then during pregnancy, and I am again making you very clearly, I am telling you that if there is history of previous two second trimester abortions during pregnancy, also you don't need to do a TVS. Directly you have to do surgery and during pregnancy you have to do surgery between 12 to 14 weeks without TVS. Don't do any TVS. Don't say that I want to first do a TVS. I want to check the length. I want to see whether the cervix is dilated or not. Nothing doing. She has history of two second trimester abortions. Directly between 12 to 14 weeks, I am going to do a circlat surgery. Now, the circlat surgery which you can do is again a vaginal circlat surgery. In vaginal circlat surgeries, the surgeries which is most commonly done is McDonald's circlat where you are applying purse string sutures, right? McDonald's circlage. Or you can go for the better one. The better one, but the more complicated surgery is Schrodinger circlage. It is better, but it is a little complicated. Now, in vaginal circlage surgeries, the stitch has to be removed at 37 weeks and then you proceed with vaginal delivery right now if vaginal circlages fail if vaginal circlage fails then you can go for abdominal circlage and the abdominal circlage 
which you can do during pregnancy is Benson and Durfee's method. I'm just writing it in capital so that you can copy it. This is uh, this is something which I have covered in uh, Marrow Updates Edition 6.5 for all the Marrow users, right? So Benson and Durfee's circlage. Benson and Durfee circlage. It can be done abdominally. It can be done. I mean, it can be done lapro by laparotomy or by laparoscopy. And again, when you do an abdominal circlage, you do not remove the stitch till the patient has completed her family. And uh, whenever she conceives, you are going to make her deliver by cesarean section. Now there is one more uh, vaginal circlage which is outdated, which is done during pregnancy, just for the namesake. Worms circlage. Worm circlage. This is outdated. You don't do it anymore. And this was done during pregnancy. Right? So, keeping all this in mind, tell me, this patient, she's anxious, she has come to you in non-pregnant states. She has previous two history of abortions. Right? Second trimester abortions. Now, all are true for management of the condition. Okay, so let us see what are the true statements. Let us, lash and lash surgery can be done in this patient now. Yes, she is non-pregnant. You can do a lash and lash surgery and you will tell her that for next three months she should not conceive. McDonald's circlage is done at 12 to 14 weeks if os is open on doing TVS and cervical length is less than 2.5 centimeters. And just now I told you that in a patient with previous history of two second trimester abortions, you don't have to do a TVS. Without doing a TVS, without noting the length of the cervix, you are going to go for circlage surgery. So second statement is incorrect. Statement 3, McDonald's, McDonald's circlage is done at 12 to 14 weeks. TVS for cervical length not needed. Absolutely right. Progesterone is started from 12 weeks. Yes. Whenever a patient comes to you and you are doing a circlage surgery, with every circlage surgery, you have to give her progesterone, which is to be started from 12 to 16 weeks and it has to be continued up till 36 weeks, right? So, uh, 1, 3 and 4 are correct statements. So, that is option C is correct. Now, this topic is so important that as a clinician, you should know what to do. And not only that, for your need, for your next, for your I and I set, everywhere this topic is being tested very recently, you know, a lot of focus has been laid on cervical circlage surgeries. So I am giving you one more hypothetical situation. There is a pregnant female who has previous history of one second trimester abortion. And suppose I ask you, Ki chalo, tell me what is the next step? What are you going to do in her? So what will your next step be? She has history of one second trimester abortion. Whenever there is history of one second trimester abortion, now don't say that I'm going to proceed with circlage directly. No. Now the next step is you have to measure cervical length and this you are going to do by TBS. And this TBS should be done between 12 to 24 weeks of pregnancy. Right? Now, you are going to measure her cervical length Plus, because she has history of one abortion, whenever female has history of one second trimester abortions or two second trimester abortions, I want all of you to write this. Progesterone, what are the indications for giving progesterone in pregnancy? Number one, if there is history of one second trimester abortion or two second trimester abortions, you have to give progesterone or if there is history of preterm labor, you have to give progesterones. Then whenever you are doing cervical circlage, you have to give progesterones and whenever the cervix is short, that means it is less than 2.5 centimeters, you have to give progesterone. Right? So, in this patient, because she has a history of one second trimester abortion, I will measure her cervical length and simultaneously at 12 weeks of pregnancy, at 14 weeks of pregnancy, I will start progesterone. Between 14 to 16 weeks is the best time to start progesterone. Right? Now, depending upon her cervical length, is my next step. If her cervical length is less than 2.5 centimeters, I will do a circlage and I will continue with progesterone. If her cervical length is more than equal to 2.5 centimeters, then I will continue only with progesterone. As I told you, whenever there is history of second trimester abortion, one or two, you have to give progesterone. History of preterm labor, you have to give progesterone. Short cervix, you have to give progesterone. And whenever you are doing cervical circlage, you have to give progesterone. Right? 
So suppose if your question comes that there is a primary gravida female, okay, now there is a primary gravida female with no history of second trimester abortions and on cervical, on TVS cervical length is less than 2.5 centimeters. Now because she doesn't have any history of abortions, I am not going to do a circular surgery. In this case, because cervical length is less than or equal to 2.5 centimeters, I only have to give her progesterone, which brings us to a very important thing that what are the indications for doing circlage surgery? So, number one indication is if your patient has history of two second trimester abortions, then even without doing a TVS, go for cervical circlage. Number two, if there is history of one second trimester abortion or an early preterm labor, which is happening at less than 24 weeks, in this case, you have to do cervical circlage only if on TVS length of the cervix is less than equal to 2.5 centimeters right and it has to be a singleton pregnancy a uh, cervical circlage is never done in a twin pregnancy so this is an indication for doing cervical circlage in my patient if there is no previous history of second trimester abortion only the length of the cervix is short then i will not say that i'm going to do a circlage surgery right in that case because the cervix is short i'm going to go for progesterone only. Is this clear to all of you? So we are calling our next patient. Our next patient is a G2P1 female with six weeks amenorrhea who is presenting to us with pain in abdomen and spotting PV. Now her urine pregnancy test is positive. So I was just now telling you that whenever a female comes to you with first trimester bleeding, one of the first investigations which you have to do after her urine pregnancy test is ultrasound. This is in contrast to a female who comes to you with third trimester bleeding. Any pregnant female who's coming to you with third trimester bleeding, ultrasound will not be the first investigation unless and until you've ruled out placenta previa, right? So since this patient is coming to me with amenorrhea, spotting PV, pain in abdomen, uh, uh, and her urine pregnancy test is positive, I will order an ultrasound, a TVS. On TVS, what we are getting is, so a TVS was very rightfully done, we are getting an empty gestational sac, 2.5 centimeters, which is seen in the tubes. So I am seeing an empty gestational sac inside the tubes, right? And a ring of fire appearance is seen on Doppler. What is the next step in management? Now, Whenever you are getting a patient whose urine pregnancy test is positive and you have amenorrhea, history of amenorrhea, there is spotting PV or bleeding PV and there is pain in abdomen. Here the most specific symptom which we have to think about is pain in abdomen. In case of uh, abortions, you know, the most uh, prominent complaint with which the patient comes to you is bleeding but in case of ectopic pregnancy the most specific symptom with which a patient is going to come to you would be pain in abdomen so her urine pregnancy test is positive i told you in such patients the next step should be you should do a tvs right because a tvs will help you in identifying whether it is an ectopic pregnancy or whether it is an intrauterine non-viable pregnancy or an early intrauterine pregnancy all this i can come to know with the help of tvs now, what are those findings on TVS which tell you that you are dealing with confirmed case of ectopic pregnancy and that is if you are getting a gestational sac and a yolk sac plus minus cardiac activity in fallopian tube. So, if you are getting a gestational sac or a yolk sac plus minus cardiac activity in the tube, that leaves no doubt that you are dealing with the case of fellow, uh, with the case of ectopic pregnancy. Whenever you get this kind of finding and they ask you what is the next step, next step becomes that I am going to go for medical management of ectopic pregnancy. Why? Because the best management is medical management. Unless and until the criteria are not getting fulfilled for medical management, till that time I'm going to say I'm going to do a medical management. But on the other hand, there are certain findings on TVS which just raise the suspicion of ectopic pregnancy. What are those? Number one, a complex adenexal mass. And that's the most common finding which you get on ultrasound in ectopic pregnancy. Number two, a ring of fire appearance on Doppler. And here is the catch. So many of you think that if there is a ring of fire appearance on Doppler, then it is a sure shot case of uh, ectopic pregnancy. No, but that's not the case. If you are getting a ring of fire appearance on uh, Doppler, then that is again just suspicion of ectopic pregnancy. Number three, empty uterus. 
and number four if you are getting a gestational sac without a yolk sac in the tube if you are getting a gestational sac with yolk sac in a tube that is confirmatory but if you are getting a gestational sac without a yolk sac in the tube that's not confirmatory right now in all these cases whenever i am getting non confirmatory findings what is your next step if the finding was confirmatory next step was medical management in this condition when the findings are non confirmatory the next step becomes beta hcg levels right beta hcg levels now i am going to check her beta hcg level and just now i told you there is a concept of critical titer was was the concept of critical titer the concept of critical titer was that in all cases of inter, if beta hcg levels on tvs are more than equal to 2000 then in all cases of ectopic pregnancy if beta hcg levels are 2000 so you should not be saying uh, more than equal to 2000 so if beta hcg levels on tvs are 2000 then in 100% cases of intrauterine pregnancy a gestational sac should be visible right so what i'm doing is i'm going to check her beta hcg levels and i'm going to see what is her titer of beta hcg if her titer of beta hcg is more than equal to 2000 international units and i am unable to see a gestational sac inside the uterus this means that i am 100% dealing with a case of ectopic pregnancy and this means again my next step becomes medical management right but just in case her beta hcg levels are less than 2000 in that case what am i going to do in that case i am going to repeat her hcg after 48 hours and after 48 hours if her beta hcg increase you know if her beta hcg increase and the increase is more than 33% so it is between 33 to 66% right this means you are dealing with an early viable intra uterine pregnancy but if her beta hcg levels increase but the increase is less than 33% in this case it means you are dealing with a case of ectopic pregnancy in ectopic pregnancy you get a typical slow rise in beta hcg levels right and if hcg levels decrease after 48 hours that means you are dealing with a case of abortion so that is how you proceed with the management in a patient of suspected unruptured ectopic pregnancy ruptured ectopic pregnancy we know that the patient is going to be in shock or guarding or rigidity will be present right or patient may complain to you of syncope so all those things tell me that i'm dealing with an uh, ruptured ectopic this is how you proceed if you are suspecting an unruptured ectopic pregnancy the other important thing is about this medical management the drug of choice for medical management is methotrexate this methotrexate should be given intramuscularly and you have to give it in the form of single dose therapy right whereas when you give methotrexate in patients of gestational trophoblastic neoplasias you give multi dose uh, methotrexate therapy alternating with folinic acid but in ectopic pregnancy you have to give a single dose methotrexate therapy which has to be given im right so on this basis let's see our patient our patient uh, the ultrasound is telling me that on tvs there is empty gestational sac in the tubes and doppler is showing ring of a uh, fire pattern which means i am getting non confirmatory findings for ectopic pregnancy and if i am getting non confirmatory findings based on these findings i will not proceed with the management so i can't give her methotrexate right what i have to do i have to do her repeat her serum beta i have to do her serum beta hcg levels check her serum beta hcg levels you are not going to repeat her ultrasound in one week why because this is a case of ectopic pregnancy in ectopic pregnancy time is essence right so i have to diagnose a case of ectopic pregnancy so i'm not going to say that i'm going to repeat her ultrasound after one week i am going to check her beta hcg levels asap clear to all of you yes okay now comes 
another patient who is now coming to you with bleeding in third trimester right now whenever a patient comes to you with bleeding in third trimester there are three differential diagnoses which should come to your mind the moment a patient steps into your opd with bleeding in third trimester the three most important ones are abruptio placenta which is the most common by and large number two placenta previa and number three you should also keep the possibility of vasa previa in your mind now based on the history of your patient you can come to know what you are dealing with if your patient is giving you history of uh, antepartum hemorrhage or bleeding after 28 weeks of pregnancy and that bleeding is not associated with any pain in abdomen bleeding is recurrent what do you understand by recurrent bleeding recurrent bleeding means that the patient is going to say that three days back i had bleeding and then the bleeding stopped and now the bleeding has started again so it is recurrent in the same pregnancy right and there it is associated with warning hemorrhage again what's warning hemorrhage warning hemorrhage says that patient will say that a few days back i had slight bleeding so initially she will have a less bleeding and later on it will be followed by excessive bleeding if patient is giving you this kind of history it points towards placenta previa right on the other hand if your patient is giving you history that she's having bleeding in a third trimester along with pain in abdomen right and there is history of any trauma and any precipitating factor that precipitating factor could be trauma that precipitating factor could be pih and the bleeding in case of uh, abruption is not recurrent so you don't get like history like this that for four days back i had bleeding now the bleeding has then the bleeding stopped and now the bleeding has started this kind of history you don't get an abruptio reason being that whenever a patient has abruptio thromboplastin is released and that thromboplastin leads to uterine contractions and patient ultimately goes into labor so you never get this kind of history in a patient with abruptio in a patient with placenta previa one more thing which you have to remember that bleeding is causeless what do you understand by this term so there is no precipitating factor in case of placenta previa most of the times your patient are going to say that she was lying she was sleeping and she, when she got up she found herself lying in a pool of blood so based on history you can come to know whether you are dealing with placenta previa or abruptio now what kind of history do you get in a patient of vasa previa typical history patient will have everything normal you know in patient will go into labor everything will be normal but the moment you rupture her membranes or her membranes get spontaneously ruptured there will be bleeding bleeding will not be much right there won't be much bleeding but in comparison to bleeding there will be a lot of fetal distress right and this bleeding will be painless bleeding painless bleeding which is having i mean uh, bleed, bleeding is less but in comparison to that bleeding patient the amount of fetal distress will be a lot more so if you get this typical history that initially the labor was progressing normally the moment you rupture her membranes there is fetal distress along with less bleeding it means you are dealing with a case of vasa previa this kind of history tells you vasa previa right but not just based on history based on physical examination also you get pointers whether you are dealing with placenta previa abruptio or vasa previa in case of abruptio as i told you thromboplastin is released so in case of abruptio thromboplastin is released when the placenta separates thromboplastin is released now because of this released thromboplastin uterus becomes tensed tender rigid right on per abdominal examination height of the uterus is more than the period of gestation in case of abruptio because in abruptio concealed variety of abruptio is also seen right so the height of the uterus will be more than the period of gestation or fetal heart sounds you will not be able to easily hear because uterus is tensed tender and rigid and there is going to be fetal distress right in case of placenta previa uterus will be soft it will be non tender it will be relaxed fetal heart sounds will be easily heard fetal parts will be easily palpable height of the uterus will be equal to the period of gestation whereas in case of placenta previa also you get the same kind of findings uterus is soft there will be fetal uterus will be soft but there will be fetal distress right and one one very important thing which you get in case of vasa previa is apt test positive whenever you have a report saying whenever you have a question saying apt test positive it means they are talking about vasa previa right 
So, uh, whenever it is a case of Vasa Previa, go for emergency cesarean section. We don't have any other management, right? Now, coming to abruptio and placenta previa, we've done a per abdominal examination. What about a per vaginal examination? Please remember. In case of placenta previa, per vaginal examination is contraindicated. In case of abruptio placenta, I have to do a per vaginal examination because, as I told you, a patient of in a patient of abruptio, thromboplastin will be released, and this thromboplastin is going to lead to uterine contraction, and patient is ultimately going to go into labor. So I want to know how much is the dilatation. But please remember that in abruptio, I am going to do a per vaginal examination only after I have ruled out placenta previa. So, it has to be done but after ruling out placenta previa, right? Now, continuing with the same case. So, continuing with this case that a patient has come to me. So, let us see a G2 patient, P1 patient presents with bleeding per vagina at 32 weeks of pregnancy. On examination, her uterus is soft, non-tender. Fetal heart sounds are 130 beats per minute, regular. Vitals of the patient are stable. What is the next step in management? Now, this question over here is indirectly telling me that I am dealing with a case of placenta previa. And now the question, a very important information which question is giving me that the vitals of the patient are stable. So whenever a case come to you with antipartum hemorrhage where they are not telling you that it is a case of placenta previa or it is a case of um, abruptio pla uh, placenta and they ask you that a patient comes to you with bleeding or suppose you are in an emergency and a patient has come to you with bleeding at more than equal to 28 weeks of pregnancy and I say okay, okay now tell me what is the next step in management so you are going to say that ma'am a patient has come to me with bleeding a pregnant female at more than equal to 28 weeks whenever a bleeding patient comes my first step always is resuscitation right and how do you resuscitate a patient a pregnant patient who's come to you with active bleeding you are going to put two large bore IV cannulas two large bore IV cannulas means cannula number 14 and cannula number 16 when you are putting the cannula you are going to take out certain samples you are going to take out her sample for ABO RH you are going to take out her sample for uh, CBC you are going to take out her sample right so you are going to take out these samples then you are going to uh, give oxygen by mask you are going to catheterize her so that you can come to know about her urine out uh, urine and you can do an input output charting now whether it is a patient of pph whether it is a patient of antipartum hemorrhage first thing is resuscitation right because a patient has come to me with bleeding now, after I have resuscitated the patient, I will start IV fluids and please remember you are going to start with crystalloids. You don't start with colloids in a patient of hemorrhage or bleeding. Now, once I have done the initial resuscitation, now I have to look at the vitals of my patient. If vitals of my patient are stable, then the next step is I want to know, although the question sometimes say or although on history and examination, I can get a clue whether I am dealing with placenta previa or abruptio, but I still have to be sure that it is a placenta previa. So, I have to do an ultrasound and the ultrasound which you do for screening purpose always is transabdominal ultrasound. On transabdominal ultrasound, if you see that the placenta is in lower segment, that means you are dealing with a case of uh, placenta previa. So, you are dealing with a case of placenta previa and in placenta previa, the investigation of choice is TVS. So, I will do a transabdominal ultrasound first, which becomes my screening ultrasound. If on screening ultrasound, I see that the placenta is in lower segment, then I go to TVS, which is the investigation of choice in case of placenta previa. Yes, that is a very important point. In placenta previa, Per vaginal examination is contraindicated, but the investigation of choice is TVS. Again, another important point is that whenever a patient comes to you with antipartum hemorrhage after initial resuscitation, if her vitals are stable, you don't directly go to TVS. First, you are going to do a transabdominal ultrasound and see where the placenta is located. So, on transabdominal ultrasound, if I saw that the placenta was in the upper uterine segment or if I get a retroplacental hematoma or if I get gel O sign positive, what is this gel O sign positive mean? Gel O sign positive means that, uh, you know, there is shimmering of the placenta 
on maternal movement or shimmering of the placenta when you move the transducer. So, if any of these signs are positive, if the placenta is in upper segment, if, the, if there is a retroplacental clot or if you are getting a jello sign positive, it means you are dealing with a case of placental abruption. And then once you know that you are dealing with a case of placenta previa, you will manage accordingly. And once you know you are dealing with a case of placental abruption, you will deal accordingly. But on the other hand, if after doing initial resuscitation, vitals of my patient are unstable. In that case, I am not going to waste my time on making a diagnosis that whether I am dealing with previa or whether I am dealing with abruptio. In that case, my next step is going to be cesarean section. So, this is very, very important as a clinician to understand that when you are going to do cesarean, when you are going to take up your patient for abdominal ultrasound. Clear to all of you? Yes? Okay. So, in this case over here, patient's vitals are stable. Patient has come to me in emergency huh, and I have uh, the vitals of the patient are stable. So, my next step in management is going to be resuscitation followed by transabdominal ultrasound. Right? Since our vitals are stable, uh, not much will be needed in resuscitation. Right? Got it? Okay. Now, uh, let's read a particular question and see how to come to an answer in case of bleeding in third trimester. So, a 34-year-old woman, Gravida 3 Para 2, is admitted to hospital at 32 weeks gestation with vaginal bleeding that started 4 hours ago. So, she has come to you at 32 weeks. She reports no pain. That's important. There is no pain. There are no contractions. Right, the course of her current pregnancy has been uncomplicated. She has two previous pregnancies which resulted in cesarean section. She did not undergo a scheduled ultrasound examination at 20 weeks. She did not go undergo an ultrasound examination, right? So, this means even if she is a case of placenta previa, she is undiagnosed. Then her BP is 110, 60, 77 is a pulse rate, respiration normal, temperature normal, fetal heart rate normal, abdominal palpation reveals normal uterine tone, no tenderness. So all these are giving me hints that I am dealing with placenta previa. The perineum is moderately bloody and she continues to pass a small amount of blood. Which of the following tests can most reliably confirm the diagnosis? Now, they are not asking you the next step. If they would have asked the next step, you would have said transabdominal ultrasound. They are asking you which of the following investigation most reliably confirms the diagnosis and that has to be a TVS. So, in this case, don't say it is transabdominal ultrasound. So, please make it a practice of reading all your questions very, very carefully before you jump to the conclusions. Now, over here, I just want to point out one thing. If your patient has previous history of cesarean sections, she has high chances of having placenta previa. That is one of the risk factors for placenta previa, previous uterine surgeries, right? Another thing, another very important thing, in all patients in whom there is previous history of cesarean section, so whenever you have a patient with previous history of cesarean section plus she has placenta previa in present pregnancy, does it ring a bell? In present pregnancy, all the marrow bachas, does it ring a bell? Whenever you have this kind of history, you should always keep in mind the possibility of placenta accreta spectrum, right? And you should be, you know, during pregnancy, you should make a diagnosis of placenta accreta spectrum because if her, there, her placenta is attached to myometrium, in this case, after cesarean, I will have to do a hysterectomy. So, I will have to take a consent for hysterectomy. Previous history of cesarean section and present placenta previa is a very, very strong, two very important risk factors for placenta accreta spectrum. Okay, quickly tell me what is that ultrasound finding which you get in case of placenta accreta spectrum? What is that one finding? The moment you read that finding, you come to know that it is a case of placenta accreta spectrum. That one ultrasound finding which is very specific for placenta accreta spectrum is presence of placental lakes. So, anytime if your question says that on ultrasound there is presence of placental lakes or moth-eaten appearance, it means they are talking about placenta accreta spectrum. Great. Chalo. Let's take our next patient in. Our next patient is a 25-year-old woman, Gravida 1, Para 0. He's at, she's admitted to the hospital at 32 weeks gestation after her roommate struck her abdomen. So, 32 weeks, she has come to you and she has history of previous and she has history of abdominal trauma. 
she complains of severe dizziness and abdominal pain so abdominal pain present right and uterine contractions bp is 90 by 50 so the vitals of your patient are unstable pulse is 99 temperature fetal heart rate is 138 per minute on examination patient is somnolent so your patient is going towards shock right the uterus is tender and strong uterine contractions are palpable fundus is palpated between xiphoid and uterus uh, Right, so uh, between xiphoid and umbilicus, it is not xiphoid and uterus, it is xiphoid and umbilicus. So, your patient is coming to you at 32 weeks. At 32 weeks, what where do you expect the height of the uterus to be? You expect it to be between umbilicus and the xiphoid process. There is no vaginal or cervical lesion and no visible bleeding. This patient is not having any visible bleeding. That's a very important thing which they are telling you. So, there is no visible bleeding, which means, first of all, tell me what is our diagnosis? Our diagnosis is that our patient is having abruption. She is having placental abruption because she has history of uh, trauma. Then she has come to me at 32 weeks. She has pain in abdomen. She has uterine contractions. Patient is going into shock, right? Then abdominal examination may uterus is tender and tensed. All this is telling me that I am dealing with a case of abruptio. I am not dealing with a case of placenta previa. Now, in abruptio, I expect blood to be visible. I expect visible bleeding. But if it is a case of concealed hemorrhage, then patient will not have any visible bleeding. Right? So, now they are saying which of the following is most likely to occur as her condition progresses. Let us see. Cessation of uterine contractions? No. Rather, patient is going to go into labor. Increase in fundal height? Yes, it is going to happen. Why increase in fundal height is going to happen? Because blood is going to collect inside the uterus. Emergence of rebound tenderness? Why will rebound tenderness happen? Rebound tenderness happens when there is blood in peritoneal cavity. In abruptio, the blood is inside the uterus. Appearance of watery vaginal discharge, not at this point of time. Whenever the membranes are going to rupture, I am going to get appearance of watery discharge. Prolapse and tenderness of posterior cul-de-sac, again, that is a sign which tells me that there is uh, peritoneal hemorrhage, right? So, in placental abruption, there can be a concealed variety or it could be a revealed variety. Another very important thing which I want to point out here is, in concealed variety, you are going to get... A uh, bluish colored uterus as if the uterus has a lot of bruises and that is what is a covilair uterus. Now, another name for placental abruption because one of the precipitating factors for placenta is trauma. It is also called as accidental hemorrhage and it is also called as uterine apoplexy. Right? Abruptio is a clinical diagnosis. It is not a diagnosis which you make on ultrasound. I mean, ultrasound can be done, but then ultrasound is not mandatory to make a diagnosis of abruptio. Two very important things you should remember. Whenever you have a patient in whom there is history of trauma and after trauma, patient is, the fetus is having decelerations, prolonged decelerations, right? So on CTG, decelerations are present. It means you are dealing with abruptio, number one. Number two, whenever you have a patient of preterm labor and on preterm labor and in case of preterm labor on per abdominal examination, uterus is tensed and tender. That again means it is a case of abruptio. So two very important clinical points which you have to note. History of trauma and patient but the fetus has uh, fetal distress is there on CTG you are getting decelerations, abruptio. Preterm labor with increased tone of the uterus, again, that indicates you are dealing with a case of abruptio. In abruptio, one of the major complications which you get is DIC. So, whenever you have a patient of abruptio, you should check her coagulation profile also because whenever it is going to be a case of DIC, what are you going to get? In a case of DIC, fibrinogen levels will be decreased, right? In a case of DIC, prothrombin time will be increased. In a case of DIC, D-dimer levels are going to be increased. So, whenever you are getting abnormal coagulation profile in a patient of abruptio, this means this patient of abruptio has developed DIC. And in this case, if they ask you, how are you going to manage? So, the first management is you have to correct DIC. And how do you correct DIC? DIC may the problem is that all 
you know, uh, the coagulative factors are consumed. All the coagulation factors are consumed in DIC. So whenever I have to manage DIC, the first thing which I have to give is, along with IV fluids, I have to give her, replenish the coagulative factors, coagulation factors from outside, which means you have to give her cryoprecipitate or you have to give her fresh frozen plasma along with blood transfusion, right? Then after you have corrected her DIC, then you should do a cesarean section. Again, an update which all the marrow subscribers, I'm sure you noted it down in edition 6 and I have made this update uh, also there. This, this update was also there in your revision videos of edition 6 that earlier it was said that if patient goes into DIC, the best mode of delivery is vaginal delivery. Now the new edition of William says that whenever a patient goes into DIC and she has abruptio, correct her DIC followed by cesarean section. So now let's call our last antenatal patient inside and then we are going to have a look at the gynae patients, right? So a 22 year old woman, Gravida 1 P0, presents to her physician at 15 weeks of gestation for prenatal appointment. She reports a 5 days history of rash on her feet, chest, on her chest, face and arms. Okay, so there is a rash on her chest, face and arms. She has a runny nose and she has bilateral knee pain, okay? So she has bilateral knee pain, she is having runny nose and she has a rash. Symptoms do not bother her but she is concerned for the baby, right? She has not travelled anywhere, that's very important, there is no travel history. She is unsure of her vaccination history, so please be very, very careful. In all pregnant females, it is very, very important that you take a proper vaccination history and travel history. These are very important when you are talking to a pregnant female and these two histories, don't forget to, these, to take these two histories and to look at them when a question is being asked, right? Her BP is 110, 70, pulse 89, respiratory rate 12, temperature 37.6, examination physical reveals a moderately dense maculopapular rash, okay? That is again another very important finding. There is a maculopapular lacy rash which is spread over a trunk, extremities and face. Then uh, there is minimal clear watery nasal discharge, no lymph nodes, spleen or uh, liver enlargement, knee joints appear to be normal. Now with this kind of history where you are getting a rash, where you are getting a runny nose, you are getting knee joints, one of the things which come to our mind is rubella, right? So, Common sense tells me that if a patient is coming to me with this kind of history, I want to look at her rubella serology. So I advise her get a rubella serology done. Although remember that even if I find that my patient is susceptible to rubella, right, she has not been vaccinated to rubella, rubella vaccine is contraindicated during pregnancy. But still I want to get a rubella serology done so that I can know whether my patient is susceptible, whether there is going to be any fetal infection, right? I want to know about all that and that is why I have ordered a rubella serology. Now the report has come. Report of the rubella serology is that rubella IgM is negative. Rubella IgD titer is 1 is to 1 is to 128 which is a very high titer. And rubella IgG avidity is high. So IgM negative, IgG high and rubella IgG avidity high. So now what do you understand by this? What interpretation are you making? I am sure all of you know that whenever IgM is positive, that means that is a recent infection and IgG positive means it is a past infection, right? What about avidity? Whenever you are getting high avidity, that means there is a low risk of vertical transmission. In other words, it's a non-primary infection. And if you are getting a low avidity, that means high risk of vertical transmission, that means a primary infection. Right, so IgM I have told you, IgG I have told you. Now we have to tell it with what is avidity. Now let's look at a combination of these IgM, IgG and avidity and see what does that mean. So suppose if your patient's IgM is negative, IgG is negative, then obviously Ig uh, avidity doesn't hold applicable. Avidity is going to hold applicable only if IgG is positive. Now IgM negative, IgG negative. 
again now this is something which means there is no current infection but because her igg is negative this patient is susceptible to rubella in such cases please do not say that i am going to give a rubella vaccine because rubella vaccine is contraindicated in pregnancy after delivery i am going to give a rubella vaccine and i am going to tell her that be careful you are rubella susceptible susceptible right now if her igm is negative igg is positive and that igg has a high avidity right high avidity means low risk of transmission igg means past infection so this means she has past infection or she is been immunized in the past so that means this female is not susceptible to infection and whenever i get a result like this igm negative igg positive and igg with a high avidity that's a very good result which i get in a uh, pregnant female right that's a very reassuring result when you get that now suppose your patient is igm positive igg positive and avidity is low now i avidity low means that she has high risk of vertical transmission which means she is a case of primary infection and which means this is the case where there are high chances of congenital rubella syndrome right then if her igm is positive igg is positive and avidity is high which means low chances of vertical transmission which means it is not a primary infection right so it's a non primary infection and there is low risk of in utero transmission then if her igm is positive igg negative avidity negative so this means very early primary infection or maybe it's a false positive infection right so this is how you interpret igm igg and avidity now in our patient igm is negative igg is positive and she has high avidity which means low risk of transmission right which means it's a non igm in any case is negative right so this means that my patient has been immunized in the past right so she, her igm is negative her igg is negative and igg avidity is high which means there was a past infection and my patient or my patient was immunized in the past that is why i am getting a scenario like this so i am not suspecting rubella in her this means that this infection which she's got which in which you are getting a maculopapular rash in which you are getting runny nose in which you are getting um you know bilateral knee joint enlargement what is it due to it means that probably it could be a case of parvovirus infection right so suppose this question comes to you in this format they give you this serology result and they ask you which of the following is the most appropriate next step option a reassure and recommend vaccination against rubella postpartum no vaccination against rubella postpartum is not needed because my patient is already immune to rubella right so she is already immune to rubella her igg titers are high her avidity is high so she is already immune to rubella recommend a pregnancy termination no not required arrange a chorionic villi sampling no i am not suspecting a rubella infection in her at all recommend additional serological testing for parvovirus b19 yes maculopapular rash plus runny nose plus bilateral knee uh, pains it could mean parvovirus b19 infection so i'm going to tell her to get testing for parvovirus b19 infection test for rubella by pcr not required i'm not suspecting a rubella infection in her right so interpretation of these findings are very very common and they are very important as a clinician as a clinician you should know you are not going to depend on a microbiologist to tell you to interpret these findings for you right another thing is you should know which vaccines are absolutely contraindicated pregnancy so all live vaccines are absolutely contraindicated mumps measles rubella bcg smallpox chickenpox and hpv vaccine now what should be the minimum time gap between a live vaccine and pregnancy minimum time gap has to be one month now generally we say that if uh, if uh, rubella vaccine has been given then a female should not conceive within one month but by chance a female conceives within that one month then mtp is not advised right so uh, this was about the antenatal patients who are coming to you